candidates. And this really is focused on city and town candidates. So um, I'm not really focusing on political action committees. There's a lot of overlap. So certainly you're gonna get something from it if that's why you're watching, uh, but you have sort of your own um, also kind of additional requirements and additional benefits. And so you're gonna wanna look maybe on the secretary's website because they have a specific uh, a guide for actual political uh, action committees. So this, this training is really focused on the candidates. Um, also, we're going to talk about registration requirements, uh, the reporting form itself, <clears throat> also advertising disclosures, and then campaign and fi um, finance enforcement and penalties, because uh, that obviously comes up a lot. You want to stay out of trouble. So topics that will not be discussed. So anything federal, you know, we're not looking at federal campaign finance law. Um, anything, again, relating to uh, PACs or other entities. Um, charter provisions, if you're in a charter city, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, I'm not going into detail on each charter provision. And then special election requirements. So we're really focused on the August, November um, election this year. And that's kind of how this presentation is based. We're not looking at special elections or recalls. <clears throat> okay, so in my introduction, I just want to be really clear and upfront. So of course, I'm not your attorney, right? Um, so I'm, I'm counsel for the league. So this is uh, really a training just to help to provide some guidance and it doesn't really create any type of attorney client relationship. So I always have to give that disclaimer at the beginning. Um, also, this presentation um, is based on the campaign finance laws in Arizona, which were essentially repealed and rewritten in 2016. So just four years ago. Um, and that's significant because um, up until then, we had a body of, of law that I think most of us had become familiar with. And when that rewrite happened, essentially all of that went away. And what we have instead is maybe bits and pieces of the old law that are kind of interwoven with some new components. And it has been really confusing for a lot of people to try to grasp the new laws and how they apply. So I would say if you're having any trouble, you're not alone. I think we're all just trying to kind of get through sort of understanding how all this applies to you. Uh, we've only really had one election cycle with these new laws because it wasn't effective until 2017. So 2018 was the first election that we had the new laws and there again was a lot of confusion, a lot of questions, obviously a lot of things that we noticed that probably need to be addressed in future legislation. Um, so hopefully maybe after this, you know, additional election cycle, we'll be able to make some of those changes. Also, um, again, the focus of the training is on you, the city and town candidates for the August, November election. Um, I'd also ask that, you know, you, you want to make sure to include your clerk if you have questions. So if you have general questions, like if you're, I try to give an example. Um, if you're just asking the difference of, you know, what is a monetary contribution versus an in-kind contribution? they can probably point you to that statute. Or if you're asking, you know, what reporting period you need to select in order to file, they might be able to help you with that. So certainly always kind of involve your clerk. They're the ones you're gonna be getting all of your campaign finance forms from because they're your filing officer. Um, but if you have specific questions, um, like you're maybe not sure how to characterize one of your contributions, that's something that the clerk can't really help you with. Um, they can't give you advice about how to do something. So it's kind of a fine line um, so, you know, please be patient with them. And again, the same with me. If you want to email me your questions, I am, if I can help you, I will. Um, if it gets sort of, you know, over that line of where it's really that you need to seek, um, you know, your own legal counsel, um, then I'll, I'll certainly provide what I can um, and then direct you that way. So the objective of this training is really to provide a comprehensive review of campaign finance laws for all of the local candidates. Um, my viewpoint is always Let's use what's out there, the state laws and the guidance um, to try to avoid any sort of violations of law. Okay, so what are we relying on? I've mentioned it a couple of times, the state laws and the guidance. So first, uh, campaign finance laws are in Title 16 of the uh, Arizona Revised Statutes, and I included a link there um, that can take you right to the web page. And then the additional guidance, um, there's a few. So there's the candidate guide, which uh, most of you probably received from your clerks already. Um, and that's on the Secretary of State's website. Also, again, for political action committees, there's the PAC guide. And then there's also the State Election Procedures Manual. Um, this is something that's published um, 
by the Secretary of State in conjunction with the counties as well as they've got, gotten our feedback as well. Um, it's a huge manual, but chapter 16 is specific to campaign finance and it mostly addresses enforcement. So it's going to talk about um, some of the uh, responsibilities of the clerk if a, a complaint comes in what they need to do to notify you and we'll go through that at the end of uh, this presentation. So I mentioned about charter cities. So you have to ask yourself, am I in a charter city? And all of these 19 cities are charter cities. So what does that mean for you? Um, if you're in one of these cities, then you're just going to want to check with your clerk to make sure that there aren't any additional requirements regarding campaign finance. I know, for instance, that there's um, some disclosure requirements um, in a couple of, of the other of the cities, uh, maybe Tempe and uh, Phoenix. Um, they may not relate to you as a candidate, but again, you're just going to want to make sure. Um, also, I think Tucson has a public financing system, uh, which is different from any of the other cities. So again, if you're in any of these cities, just make sure you check with your clerk that there aren't any additional requirements, um, you know, in addition to state law. If you're not on that list, then you're basically a general law city, and so you're just following the state statutes. So what is campaign finance? So it refers to the monies that are received and spent to promote a candidate or a ballot measure. It's kind of pretty straightforward. It's basically what you're taking in, and what you're uh, putting out in order to uh, get elected. So what are your responsibilities? So first you need to determine if you need to register as a committee. And we'll walk through that in a second. Uh, then you need to register if you do hit that threshold by using a specific form. Um, it's called the Statement of Organization and you obtain also the candidate finance guide and then the reporting forms all from the clerk. And then the next is filing. So you're gonna to have to file reports in a timely manner. Uh, the deadlines are provided by the clerk and then also you're gonna file termination documents when you decide to close the committee. And then also respond, and this is important. Um, you're gonna to need to make sure that you're responsive to reporting reminders as well as requests for response if a complaint is filed against you. All right, so let's talk about committee registration. So if you're a candidate running uh, for city or town office, you would have to register if you meet the $500 threshold by receiving or spending any monies of up to 500. So if, if basically you're a candidate plus you meet that $500 threshold, then you have to register within 10 days of reaching that threshold. And we're gonna break it down here a little more. So how do you determine the $500 threshold? Because if you're watching this, and I think most of you are, are local candidates, we already sort of checked that first box. You're a local candidate running for office. So to determine the $500 threshold, <clears throat> so it's based on the contributions and expenditures of at least $500 in connection with your candidacy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I have an example here to kind of provide it because sometimes the in any combination of the total um, can get confusing. So for example, if you're a candidate who receives $300 in contributions and then you spend $200, the total amount has already reached $500. And so you would be required to register. So it's not that it's just you have to receive 500 and spend 500. It's really any combination that equals at least $500. And then that's when you are hitting that threshold. Also, if you are less than that, there is no longer a threshold exemption statement that used to be in the old law um, where everybody had to file something, whether it was a state exemption statement or whether it was a registration form. Now, if you're under $500 and you remain under $500 throughout your election cycle, you do not have to file any type of statement or any type of registration. But it is important that if you are under that $500 and you don't think you're gonna hit it, that you still, um, keep track of all of your contributions because if there's even a slight chance or you do hit that $500, you are required to provide all of that contributor information as if you had been registered. So you're still gonna wanna keep track for yourself uh, in case that it, um, you do hit that threshold. So how do you register? So you register again by using the statement of organization. That's the form that the filing officer gives you. You have to file it within 10 days as you qualify for a committee. So once you've sort of spent, you know, you received that $300 and then you spent that 200 and you hit that 500, you have 10 days to go ahead and come into the clerk's office and to file that statement of organization. 
And I've had some questions before about who is the filing officer. And as I said, it's your clerk. It's your city or town clerk for city and town candidates. And that's um, basically by statute. You know, they have essentially filing officers for every level of jurisdiction. And so it's important that you go to your city and town clerk. I've had some, um, especially this year, a lot of people um, who are running for, for city or town office that are you know, getting forms or getting information from their counties, you really need to go to your actual city or town clerk. Um, there are some distinct differences. And so you shouldn't be using sort of other, other forms from other jurisdictions. So what is the statement? Uh, the statement of organization is a registration form um, that again is required by state law once you hit that $500 threshold. Um, it requires basically, you know, contact information for your chairman, your treasurer, your bank account. It's just essentially, you know, a registration form that has your basic information. Once you file it, the clerk will issue you the identification number to your committee. So part of that statement is you need to identify who is going to be your chair and who's going to be your treasurer. So the chairperson can be someone who's, you know, really involved in your campaign, or it can be someone who's more of a figurehead. But your treasurer is someone who is the custodian of your books and accounts and has to sign off on all of your financial transactions and remains legally and personally responsible for all of your filings. So you're not going to want to do any, you know, significant transactions or reporting without having your treasurer look at it. Now for candidate committees, you are permitted to be your chair and your treasurer. Um, this is unique. Political action committees can't do that. So for your own um, uh, committees as candidates, you can actually be your chair and your treasurer, which makes sense just because you usually have um, you know, more control and more investment in your actual campaign. So the information that is included on the statement, um, so you're going to want your committee name, uh, a mailing address, email, website, number, and again, the bank information. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the banks in a moment. But for the rest of the information, you're just going to want to make sure that if, uh, you know, whatever information you're providing, that it's actually, you're going to be checking that, that information. So for instance, if you're going to provide an email address um, that's different, and a lot of people do, you know, it's kind of easy to sort of delineate um, if you have a committee email address, just make sure you're actually checking that email pretty frequently. And I believe for uh, your mailing addresses that you can't, um, it needs to be like a street address. It can't be a PO box. So this is the same thing for your chair, right? You have to make sure that all of your information, um, again, basic contact information is listed. You're also gonna have to put your occupation or the chair's occupation and the employer. And then same thing for treasurer. So this is all the information that you need to include, basic contact info, occupation and employer. So I wanted to talk a bit about banks. Um, so your monies have to be in a bank account and you have to have that bank account listed on your statement of organization. Now you don't need to have your bank account number, you know, they don't want any routing numbers or anything like that. They just want to know where you're actually going to have that account. Um, and so it's required by law that your committee monies have to be segregated in a different bank account. So you can't put your uh, committee monies in your personal checking account. It has to be separate. You have to have a separate um, actual account. And sometimes we have some questions about this because people are um, not sure how to create this account, or maybe they go down to their bank and their, their bank isn't sure how to create this account. We've had those questions before. Um, unfortunately, it's not something that like the clerks can help you with. Uh, this isn't, you know, it's really banking policy of what it is they require from you. Um, so I always suggest that if you're having trouble establishing a bank account, that maybe you try to talk to some other candidates, see where they have, you know, maybe where they're banking. Um, sometimes it helps if you've already had a bank that's sort of established this process, uh, or maybe what they did to meet the requirements um, when you talk to those other candidates. That's kind of the best suggestion I can offer. Um, again, the clerks don't have any ability to sort of assist you with that because it's really based on each bank. Okay, so now you're gonna be finalizing the statement of organization. You provided all the information, right? Your committee name and how to contact, your chair, your treasurer. And again, if you're, you as the candidate decide to be the chair and treasurer, you know, that information will be the same. Um, and then now you have to, and your bank information, and now you have to um, basically swear under penalty of perjury uh, 
these three requirements that you've read the Secretary of State's campaign finance guide and that's that link that I shared in one of the first few screens that you agree to comply with Arizona campaign finance law. And then also you agree to accept all notifications and statements service of process any important documents via your committee's email address. So that's why I really stress that it's important that it's an email address you check often. Um, the Secretary of State's guide has basically said it's it's not a defense that you, you know, if if you don't respond to something uh, timely that you can just say, oh, I, I don't check that account. Um, you're basically under penalty of perjur perjury um, attesting that you are going to be uh, checking that and ex you're agreeing to accept all notifications via that committee email address. So, you know, make sure that when you do check that address, if you don't see a lot there, you know, check your, your spam or your junk folder just to make sure you aren't missing anything. So again, once everything is complete, the clerk will issue you the identification number for your candidate committee. And you'll use that ID number um, on future correspondence as well as your campaign finance report form. So I had a couple questions here that I just wanted to, to throw out. So what if you need to change the information on your statement of organization? So that's okay, that's contemplated by the law. If there's a change, then you just have to file an amended statement within 10 days of the change. So sometimes this happens with your bank information. So maybe you, you know, plan to go to you know, a particular bank and that's the information you write on your statement of organization. And then once you get there, you realize it's not gonna work there. And so you have to go to a different bank that's fine. You just need to come back to the clerk's office within 10 days of that change and then you need to um, update that information so that they have all of it. Same thing with any of the other contact info. So we talked a little bit about treasurer and I said how the treasurer was the custodian of the records and is legally and personally responsible. So we're going to kind of go over a little bit of the responsibilities so you kind of understand what they need to do. So first of all, your committee is required to keep records of all of this, your contributions, um, identification of any contributor, anybody who's contributing basically to your um, committee of, of at least $50 or more. That has to be reported. Although we do suggest you just get that information from everybody if you have to report them later, um, if you do hit that, you know, if, if they basically go over $50. Um, also, you have to report or keep records of cumulative totals of each contributor and then all the contact information from them because you'll need that for the report. And then you need to preserve all these records for at least two years following the end of the election cycle. Um, so don't think that just once the election's over, you can kind of toss everything. You got to keep it for two years and the clerk or the town attorney who's the enforcement officer, um, they can always ask you to produce those records. So just make sure again that you have them handy and you keep them in a safe place. So recording receipt of contributions. So sometimes people aren't clear about, you know, when you're recording it, when is it that you deem it that a contribution has been received. And so the, uh, the guidelines from the state have basically been either on the date that the committee knowingly takes possession of the contribution, which means that you're aware that you possess it, um, or maybe the date of the check or credit card payment. For in-kind contributions of services, which is not money, but it's more like goods and services that you're receiving, um, the contribution is made on the date the service is performed or the date the committee receives the service. So incomplete contributions comes up sometimes because, you know, again, as the treasurer, you're trying to make sure you have the information necessary to complete the report. Um, maybe you, you got the contribution and you didn't have all the information. Like, for instance, maybe you didn't have get their address. Um, so the, again, the, the state requires that you have to make your best efforts to seek this missing information. Um, and what that means is you have to at least make sort of one attempted written communication uh, to the uh, contributor asking them for that information, or if you want to do it over the phone or something like that, then you at least need to document in writing when exactly it is that you tried to reach out to them, you know, the message you left, what you were asking for. Um, there just needs to be something in writing. And then you need to ask for uh, identification and inform the contributor that that's required by state law. Um, and then also, you know, if for some reason you can't get the information, don't, you know, uh, I mean, you want to make sure to always file your reports timely. So don't kind of wait to get that information, file your report. And then if you get that information later, then you can go ahead and amend your report at a later time. 
So receipts of expenditures. So we talked about recording receipts of contributions. And so this is similar. So the expenditures is what you're spending. So an expenditure disbursement is made on the date that you're authorizing the monies to be spent or the date the monies are withdrawn from your committee account. So we have some examples, of course, for a transaction by check of, you know, the date that the committee signs the check. If it's a credit card transaction, you know, it's the date the committee signs the authorization for that charge. For electronic, it's made at the date the committee electronically authorizes it. And then if you're for an agreement to purchase goods or services, it's made on the date the parties enter into the agreement or the date the purchase order is issued. So those are just some examples to help you out. So when you're recording receipts of expenditures. So if you have an expenditure that doesn't really fall into one of those categories, uh, the committee is able to sort of treat it as either on the date the committee authorized the expenditure or on the date the money is withdrawn. But it's really important that you're always consistent which one you use. Um, so don't use the date of a check for some contributions, but then you know, you're using a different kind of calculus for another type of uh, expenditure. So just make sure that you're consistent. It, that just helps you not only for your record keeping, but it also um, helps people not speculate that maybe you're trying to skirt some type of law. So I get this question sometimes, multiple committees, right? Because we talked about, you know, your statement of organization is filed and now you have your candidate committee. Um, as a candidate, you know, can you have more than one committee open? Well, uh, state law says a candidate may only have one committee open, one candidate committee in existence for the same office during the same election cycle. So for instance, if you're running for mayor, you can't have two mayoral committees open. You can only have one. So that's just kind of an example, again, for the same office during the same election cycle. But what if you have a committee open from a previous election cycle and you're running for re-election? Do you need to close it and open a new one? And that answer is no. So if you're running for the same office in consecutive election cycles, you can leave that committee open. Um, you know, certainly you can terminate and, and start over if you want, but most people I think tend to find it's easier to just keep it open. Um, and then, you know, if you need to make any changes again on that statement of organization, because maybe some time has passed, some things need to be updated, you can go ahead and amend that statement of organization, but it's still the same committee. So what if you open a committee for council for a past election, but then this year you decide to run as a mayoral candidate? Do you need to close the council committee? So no, I mean, again, uh, if we look to that first question, you just can't have one can you know, committee open in existence for the same office for the same cycle. But here, if you're having a council committee open and a mayoral committee open, those are separate if you're a directly elected mayor. So um, you can have maintain multiple committees for different offices. But again, the more that you have, the more responsibilities you have, because you're still going to be responsible for any sort of reporting requirements for both of those committees. So just something to keep in mind. All right, committee registration. Uh, can a candidate who does not meet the $500 threshold still register as a candidate committee? This question actually comes up a lot, and the answer is yes. There is nothing that prohibits you from registering early, even if you haven't reached that $500. However, once you register, then you are subject to reporting requirements. So it can't be sort of a pick and choose of, well, I filed my statement, but I really didn't hit the threshold, and so now I'm not going to report. If you're registering, then you're, again, agreeing to that you're going to follow the campaign finance laws and that you're going to be reporting as well. So just keep that in mind. So if a candidate only spends his or her own money, does the candidate have to register and report when they meet the $500 threshold? And the answer is yes. So personal monies are defined as contributions in state law, and they're included in that $500 threshold calculation, and they must be reported. However, the caveat for personal monies is that you are not limited by contribution limits. So there's no uh, particular cap. You can give as much as you want to your campaign. Um, but again, it, it does count essentially um, when you're looking at, at that $500 threshold calculation and you do have to register um, if you're using personal monies that go over that amount. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about some key terms. One is contributions. We kind of throw that word around a lot. So I wanted to kind of make sure everybody had a, a good sense of what it means. So a contribution means any money, advance, deposit, or other thing of value that is made to a person for the purpose of influencing an election. 
So anything that someone is giving you, if it's money or again, other thing of value that's pretty broad that they're giving you for your candidacy, that is a contribution. And that can be, you know, uh, money um, or the fair market value of certain things. And we'll talk about in-kind contributions as well. Um, the full purchase price of any item from a committee um, and also a loan. So these are just some examples. A person may make any contribution, not otherwise prohibited by law, that's important. Um, and then contributions do have to be reported unless they're specifically exempt. So we'll talk here about the exemptions. So what is not a contribution? So I'm not gonna go into detail because there's about four of these screens, um, but just to kind of mention, volunteer services are not a contribution, um, but they have to meet some requirements. And also um, news stories. So let's say someone's interviewing you about becoming a candidate or you know, your, your election, um, that's fine. That's not considered a contribution as long as one, you don't own the actual, um, the, the actual newspaper um, and that so that you're, and you haven't paid for it essentially. Also to defray like any expense of, of, a, of a meeting, let's, so let's say you're an incumbent um, and you're being, you know, invited to go to a certain tour or a conference. Um, so that essentially kind of uh, exposure is not deemed a contribution. Again, as long as they're not trying to basically hold a campaign rally for you, um, then essentially it's fine. It's not a contribution. Although you do have some other reporting requirements in your financial disclosure statement. So just, I put the references there, just kind of keep that in mind. So what else is not a contribution? So political party payments to their nominee and also political party operating expenses. Now I listed these, but they do not really apply to you. Um, so city and town elections are nonpartisan elections except for the city of Tucson. So 90 of our cities are nonpartisan and then we have Tucson. So um, if you are, I think the bulk of you are, you know, obviously not in Tucson. So um, these two components don't even apply. And also what else is not a contribution? Um, there's a whole long list here about interest earned on certain deposits, uh, transfers between committees. And then I highlighted payment of committees legal or accounting expenses by any person because we're going to talk about that more. And then also extension of credit on, uh, you know, on behalf of a committee uh, by a creditor that isn't a contribution. And so again, there's kind of a long list. But let's talk more about the legal services. So if someone pays an attorney for legal advice, can you pay for that service out of your committee monies? And if so, are you required to report it? So for actual, um, uh, let's say you had a, you needed legal advice for a personal issue. Let's say you were kind of litigating with your HOA and it had nothing to do with your uh, candidacy. Um, so no, you couldn't use your committee monies to help with your personal legal matters. However, if it's for, if you're using legal services related to your committee, let's say a complaint was filed against you it's pretty complex. You can't answer it on your own. You decide you need to hire an attorney and the attorney is reviewing that and responding for you, then yes, you can use your committee monies to pay for that legal um, service. So the question about reporting has been a little bit more complicated. So as you kind of saw on that previous slide, so what was not a contribution? So it's listed in there that legal services is not a contribution. It's exempt essentially. So you typically would not have to report it However, there is litigation pending um, and that provision that I highlighted is actually enjoined by a court order right now, which basically means it, you, you, that's, it's not in effect. Um, and the appeal is pending and so that might change. But for now, sort of that exemption is not in effect and so really it might be best to just report it. So you can still use your committee monies for committee legal services, but you're gonna probably want to report it at this stage at least until we know um, the outcome of that appeal. So more exemptions from contributions, um, nonpartisan communications like just general voter registration turnout efforts, that's not a contribution. Um, if you're paying for arguments in a publicity pamphlet, um, again, kind of you see this list of just different kind of specific types of payments. So all of these are exempt from contribution. I think we have, yeah, this is the last slide of exemptions. So uh, cost of hosting a debate or candidates forum. So if someone says, hey, you know, I see you're both running for mayor. 
I want to invite all of the candidates running for mayor to a forum and, and have a debate. That's fine. That's not considered a contribution. Um, again, as long as um, it's, it's not, you know, in a sense, basically trying to just promote one candidate. And then also voter guides. A lot of the cities do voter guides uh, or maybe even have some organizations that like to do voter guides. Um, again, fine if they include you, it's not considered an in-kind contribution as long as it's not just all about you as a featured candidate. Um, also, what's not a contribution is monies that are loaned by, you know, a bank. Um, basically, you know, if you're refinancing your home at the same time that you're, you know, uh, running for office, um, that's not going to be seen as a contribution to you. That's kind of in your personal business, again, the kind of separate from your candidacy. And then sort of any publications, so any type of books or anything like that that might be published um, that might have to be, you know, maybe they're about you, but um, they're kind of looked at as, as not uh, being deemed contributions. Okay, so that's a very long list of exemptions, and I know that's a lot of information. Um, I would say, you know, take some time later when you get the, the uh, PowerPoint to kind of just read through it. Really, those only come up when you're trying to decide whether or not you have to report something. So maybe you're looking at something and you're saying, well, I think this is a contribution when you look that it's anything of value or it's money, but then maybe you want to check those exemption lists just to see does it fall under any of those exemptions, because if it does, then you would not have to report it. So methods of accepting contributions, you know, you can do it all the sort of traditional ways, right? Check, cash, credit card, anything like that. Um, I included here a little bit about um, cryptocurrency uh, because that's come up a couple times, surprisingly, even at, at our local level. So there is no state law that talks about cryptocurrency with regard to campaign finance. Um, and so trying to determine what that value is, is, has been challenging. And so at this stage, there really isn't much out there. Um, this is one of those times where if you, you really want to accept cryptocurrency, that you really need to seek special um, counsel, either from an accountant, from an attorney, um, someone that's going to help you to determine what it means when you uh, accept it, what is the value when you're accepting that cryptocurrency, and then maybe if you decide to expend it, what the value is, because frankly, there just isn't any guidance in state law. Um, and so we don't really know how that would, you know, if a complaint was filed against you that maybe you thought the cryptocurrency was at a certain level, but maybe someone was accusing you that it was at a much higher level that exceeded contribution limits. There's not a lot of guidance for us to determine how to actually uh, kind of figure that out. And so I think you just want to be very careful and have everything, you know, all your ducks in a row, basically, um, talking to an attorney or again, accountant or someone who is knowledgeable in that area so that you can show um, and demonstrate that you, know, you were very thoughtful about it and this is why you believe the value is what it is. So just kind of a caveat on that. Also, I wanted to go back here to the joint contribution. So often you know, get text from somebody that, um, you know, it's a joint account, um, but it's only one spouse that's, that signed it. And so typically with that, you're going to just, you know, essentially um, allocate that contribution to the person who signed it um, and not necessarily the other spouse. If both spouses sign it, then you would go ahead and kind of do an even split. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, kind of joint accounts later. Okay. And again, so what is an expenditure? Okay, so we talked about contributions. Of course, that's the money that you're taking in, right? Or anything of value that you're taking in. So expenditures is the opposite. It's what you're spending. It's really any purchases or payments, anything kind of going out or other thing of value again that you're making uh, for the purpose of influencing an election. So again, a person may make any expenditure not prohibited by law. So that's the definition of expenditure. And then these are the exemptions to expenditure, kind of similar to those exemptions to contribution. There's not as many as contribution, but they're similar. So again, we have sort of that individual's volunteer services. We have value of a news story. We have, uh, again, political operating expenses that don't apply to nonpartisan elections, um, nonpartisan communications about voter turnout, et cetera, uh, publicity pamphlet payments. And again, that payment for legal or accounting services is also included in here. So again, that's 
enjoined at the moment. So that means, you know, if you have a payment that you're paying committee monies for services for your committee that are legal or accounting, at this stage, you're probably going to want to report it because of, of the pending uh, litigation. And then also, again, publishing a book that is exempted from expenditure. So that's essentially contributions and expenditures. Um, so this is a question I get sometimes. So am I limited from accepting contributions from any person or entity? And yes, you are. So it's your responsibility to pay careful attention to the identity of the donors to ensure that you're not violating contribution restrictions. So sometimes this comes up like, cause people ask, why do I need to ask for somebody's identification? Or why do I need to get all this contact information? Well, one, you have to report it, it's required, but you need to make sure that the person who's giving you that contribution is really that person and that you're allocating again, that contribution to that person because you don't want them to essentially uh, pretend to be somebody else and skirt contribution limits because each individual can only give a certain amount. Um, also, candidate committees may only accept contributions from individuals, other can can and candidate committees if conditions are met, and then political action committees and partnerships. So that's who you can receive monies from. Um, and then candidate committees cannot accept monies from uh, corporations, uh, unions, LLCs, um, anything like that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but those are prohibited contributions. You cannot take them. So what happens if you accidentally do accept a contribution? You know, maybe you had a friend, um, you know, a contribution that's prohibited. Let's say you had a friend who you thought was going to give in, in his, you know, as an individual, but then the check arrived and it actually is from a corporation, the corporation that they work for. Um, so that's unlawful, again, for you as a candidate to accept that. So you have to refund it immediately. Um, you're going to want to document carefully the circumstances that led to you accepting it and what, you know, that you understand is prohibited, what actions were take to remedy that situation. Um, hopefully you wouldn't get, you know, a complaint filed against you, but if you do, at least you have all that documentation to show that you, you took care of it as soon as possible. So am I limited in how much I can accept in contributions? So yes. So allowable sources, um, you are only able to accept a certain amount and they vary based on, you know, who's contributing and the office sought. Um, so you really have to understand this. And I have the link here to the uh, Secretary of State's website that has the full contribution limit chart. But that chart actually has everybody listed. It has, you know, state let, you know, statewide candidates, legislators, uh, local candidates, et cetera. So it's a pretty huge chart. Um, so I've tried to just pull out what we need here as city and town candidates so that you can see it. So you'll see the type of contributor is, you know, individual, the limit is uh, $6,450 for a local candidate. Um, partnerships, the same amount. Candidate committees, the same amount, but only, again, if certain criteria are met. PACs, so other, you know, political action committees can also give you $6,450. Mega status, if they, uh, PACs have a mega status, it's double that, and we'll talk about why in a second. And then political parties, again, only applies to Tucson, but if you were the nominee, then you can get an additional $10,200. And then you'll see corporations, LLCs, other types of trusts, co-ops, and unions, those are all prohibited. So you should not be receiving any contributions from them. So let's talk about election cycle, because those contribution limits are tied to one election cycle. Um, for city and town races, the election cycle constitutes the two-year period beginning the first day of the calendar quarter after the calendar quarter in which the second runoff is scheduled. And then it ends on the last day of the calendar quarter in which the city or towns immediately following second runoff general election is scheduled. So I don't know about you, but when you read that, it does not make a lot of sense. It's, it's not very clear. So I've kind of broken it down here. First, you need to figure out the calendar quarters. And I think this is probably the easiest for everyone to understand. So those are basically, you know, in three. So you have, you know, January through March is your first calendar quarter. Um, you know, April through June is your second, July through September is your third, and then October through December is the fourth. So this is the meaning of calendar quarter as defined in statute. So then you need to determine when is your city or town's second runoff or general election scheduled. So you're going to see here that I used 2018 and that's deliberate because we kind of need to go back to that date in order to figure out our current election cycle. 
So in November 2018, that fell in the last quarter of 2018. So that last, you know, the first day essentially after that calendar quarter was January 1st of 2019. And then that sort of second piece of the formula is what is the next second runoff or general election schedule? Well, that's this year, November 2020. So that's in the last quarter of this year, which then the last day is December 31st. So then that's how you pull your, basically your election cycle. It began January 1, 2019. It's that first day after the last quarter of the last sort of scheduled election. Um, and then it ends December 31st of this year, which is after this now second scheduled election. So that's how you do it. And I did it also for the next, so you can kind of see same sort of thing. So for this year, November, 2020, um, you know, we're in that last quarter. So the first day again, after that quarter is gonna be January 1st of 2021. And then we're gonna go all the way through November, 2022. And then December 31st is that last date. And so the next election cycle begins January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2022. So for those of you that are on the sort of August, November, even numbered year cycle along with the state, um, it's usually pretty simple because it's gonna sort of be that January one in that odd numbered date through the December 31st of that even numbered. So just keep that in mind. But if you ever have trouble figuring it out, you can certainly ask your clerk or ask me and we'll help you out. So what is the importance of the election cycle? Well, election cycle determines your contribution limits and when to file your campaign finance reports. So if you're elected in August or November this year for a four year term, there are two election cycles within your term, right? Because we kind of looked at the formula. So your next election is now going to be August or November of 2024. So that's a four year term. So the first election cycle begins on that January 1st, 2021 and ends on December 31st, 2022. So you can accept, remember we go back to the contribution limit page. You can accept at this point, it will be 6,550 from an individual. And you'll see that it's up hundred dollars than what I just mentioned. That's because on January one, it actually increases by hundred dollars every January in an odd numbered year. So then that's that first cycle in your term. And then you're gonna have a second ele election cycle start January 1, 2023, ending in December 31st, 2024. And you can accept again from that same individual, 6,650, again, it goes up $100. So um, election cycles are important because basically you can get from the same individual or the same partnership or the you know, same pack, um, basically, additional money is almost double, basically. So you get sort of two bites at the apple in one four-year term. So what happens if there is no runoff? How is the election cycle determined? So sometimes I get, you know, concerned about this because, you know, maybe in your city you haven't had a runoff in years, and that happens a lot. You know, a lot of our folks are elected at the uh, first election. So that's okay. The election cycle is based on the scheduled runoff. So it doesn't matter whether or not you have it, that is still what you use to make sort of that determination. So it's not gonna change just because you haven't had a runoff. Okay, so that's pretty much it for sort of like the registration, all the key terms, just kind of all the general information. And now we're gonna get into the actual campaign finance reporting um, and talk about the form. Okay. So what I tried to do is um, kind of model this along so that way if you actually have your form with you, you can see, um, you know, I try to identify certain sections um, so you can kind of go along. As we get into it, you'll see I also started referencing the schedule sheets as well. Um, again, just to kind of provide you with some guidance um, that you can kind of maybe match the, the presentation to your actual report form. So first things about the report form. So this was designed by the state. Um, so when they did the whole big rewrite in 2016, um, they also took away the ability for your cities and towns to make their own forms. Um, and so we now have one state prescribed form. What that means is that we don't have the ability to maybe make some changes as easily as, as we'd like to. So again, I think hopefully after this election cycle, we can make some suggestions about some of the things that we've noticed that uh, would help us to go ahead and have an easier time for our candidates to, to file. 
um, most of you know the state and I think some of the counties and even a couple of our cities have electronic filing systems. Um, you know, the plan is, I think, down the road for cities and towns to all be able to opt into the state system. They just aren't at, at that, you know, they don't have the ability yet to kind of have us in, but that's the goal. Um, I think it's easier <clears throat> if there's one system and uh, everybody can use it and it's, it's a little bit more user friendly as well. So that's kind of, the, again, the goal down the road. Um, all statements and reports are required to be publicly available on the internet. So that does mean that your report will be posted most likely on the city or town website, probably in sort of the elections uh, page. So on your uh, cover page, <clears throat> the first thing you'll see on the right hand corner is your committee ID number. That's the ID number that was issued by the clerk on your statement of organization. So again, that's what you need to put there in your committee ID form. And then you'll have committee information and that's pretty general, right? It needs to make sure that your committee name is the name that you're putting on um, your report, uh, your office sought, you're gonna wanna check that box, the city or town, and then list your office. Is it council, is it mayor? And then reporting period. So there's two different columns. So one is reporting period and the other is report due. So the reporting period um, is essentially, you know, basically kind of divided and it tells you a time frame of when your report, you know, what is it covering? And then your report due is when it should be filed. <clears throat> so I wanted to highlight that the there's a part of it that's called local only like because it has probably I would say 20 or so different rows of reporting periods um, and some of them say local only and people get confused because they think oh well I'm a local candidate so I need to select one of those boxes for this race in August November do not select anything that says local only it does not apply to you. Um, if this is your regular candidate election in August, November this year, do not select it. Um, that is really based on off cycle elections. We have some of our charter cities that have their regular elections in the spring. Um, and so, or maybe you're having a recall election, something like that. That's basically saying, you know, basically locals might be having sort of different elections and that's when you select it. But for your purposes, for this election coming up, do not select anything that says local only. Um, also, you're going to want to select the date again that's based on the election cycle. Um, and sometimes there's some confusion because let's say you've had, um, you know, a committee that you just, you just opened and um, it, there's nothing sort of a date that really actually matches it. And so we'll talk a little bit more in a second about what to do in that situation. Um, because there is a box sort of above that reporting period uh, column that talks about, you know, put this, this date in if it doesn't match one of the sort of start dates in the reporting period. And that's where you would kind of, kind of amend it or fix it so that they know that there's a distinction. Um, for the report due column, so you have your first date, obviously at the beginning of the filing period, but it's not due until that second day that's listed. And then reports are due on the deadline. If you're filing in person, it's before the clerk's office closes, right? So you're gonna wanna make sure that you, you get into the office there on the day of the deadline. Um, or if you're filing electronically, um, which you can do, and which is encouraged uh, by this law, then you can scan it and then send sort of a PDF uh, of, of this by email. It just needs to be received before midnight on that deadline in order to be timely. So reporting period is kind of similar to election cycle. Um, it's kind of based on this calendar quarter. Um, that's what, how it determines when your filing deadline is going to be, um, when it actually occurs. So I think I have, let me see, oh, I guess we'll go back. So it talks a little bit about, you know, we have those three calendar quarters. Um, and so you have your first quarter, right, January through March, we talked about that. And so it's always going to be due 15 days after the end of that quarter. And so that's April 15th. So same thing with uh, the next quarter, right? So you're going to have April 1st through uh, June 30th. And so it's going to be due July 15th. So you're always kind of on a quarter basis until you get to the election. So you've had probably a couple already that you've filed and the next one coming up is July 15th. And then you're going to hit what's called a pre-election report. And state law requires that it has to cover the activity from the beginning of the quarter, which would be July 1, through 17 days before the election and has to be filed then seven days later. 
So for this coming upcoming primary on August 4th, the pre-election date covers July 1st through July 18th, and then it has to be followed, you know, filed on July 27th. So it's going to be a little bit odd because you're just going to have filed on July 15th all the way through June 30th, and then you're going to have to file again within a couple weeks um, another report that's your, again, sort of the bulk of, of July. And then when you follow up, you're going to uh, do your what's called a post-election report, but the secretary's, you know, form just says it's a third quarter. It's due on October 15th, right, because that's that next sort of quarter report due date. Um, but now you've already, you know, basically done 18 days worth of reporting in July, so you're going to start at July 19th through September 30th. And that should be reflected already on the form, but just to kind of give you an understanding of why there's sort of this extra election, pre-election report, kind of throws a little bit of a wrench into the, the quarterly filing. Um, but it, you know, the legislature has felt that a lot of that activity leading up to the election, just the first, you know, the few weeks before is the most important in terms of campaign finance. So they wanted that additional report. So your reporting period for candidates is very unique. Um, so it's actually only based on the 12 month period preceding the general election at which you're seeking election. So that's scheduled runoff again. So um, it's interesting because this was a big change in the law. It used to be that candidates and everybody always had to file on a pretty regular basis. Uh, but now you're only having to file during that 12 month period preceding that, that runoff date. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about it here. So first here are the reporting deadlines. Again, this is already on your cover page in the Secretary of State's forum that's provided by the clerk. Uh, but I just sort of pulled it all out again, just so you know the dates um, to, you know, that apply to you this, this uh, election. And the ones in red haven't occurred yet. Obviously, they're, they're still upcoming. So let's answer some questions here. So how do I know when to start filing some reports? So the timing and scope of kind of when you file, again, depends on that scheduled runoff date. Um, so if it's scheduled for November 3rd of 2020, um, you know, that's the scheduled runoff. Whether you have it or not, that's the scheduled runoff this year. So the 12 month sort of look back period is November of 2019. Again, that was the last quarter of 2019. So when is the basically due date after that quarter? It's January 15th of 2020. So that's when you should have filed your first report and it should have been a cumulative report, right? It, it had, there shouldn't be no, there should be no gaps. It should have been from the last time you filed to now you still have to report all of that information, even though you haven't filed in, in, in probably in a couple years. Um, all that information is still required. Um, so anything contributions you've received, you know, maybe a year ago, um, anything expenditures, all of that, it needs to be reflected in that first cumulative report. Um, so usually that's a big one just because people may, may have, if they've been active, um, you know, they haven't reported in a while. So what happens if you didn't have a committee open yet, January 15th? So if you open your committee, um, you basically later, then your first report due is at the next filing period. So for example, let's say, say you file your statement today, right? June 10th, this is when you've hit your threshold and you're filing your paperwork. So again, remember the next report, if you look on the cover page, is due July 15th. So that's what you would actually, your first filing. And again, you have to do the same thing. You have to make sure that you're reporting everything from the election cycle. So, you know, if you started collecting, you know, or contributions, um, you know, back in April, and maybe you hadn't hit the threshold yet, that's okay. Um, but now you've actually hit the threshold, you still have to go back and report from day one when you actually started and not necessarily like from today when you filed. So just keep that in mind, it has to be cumulative. So do you file a report in non-election years? So for candidates, no. And this is like I said, have been a big change for everybody. So political action committees, PACs, they have different reporting requirements. They do have to report all the time. But candidates, again, are only on that 12 month window based on that scheduled runoff. So here's an example. If you're elected this year, um, August of 2020, and again, a four-year term, then your last uh, report, this election cycle, is going to be due January 15th of 2021, right? Because that's going to cover all the way through December 31st of this year. That's the end of the cycle. So then your next report is not due until January 15th of 2024, the year that you run again. 
So that's three years without filing. And I know that always shocks a lot of people and they think, nope, you must be wrong, but that is the way the law is structured. So just remember during that time period, even though you're not reporting, that you're gonna to wanna to keep track of all your contributions and expenditures, because again, on that first report, you're in January, 2024, you're gonna to have to report everything. There again, can't be any gaps in reporting. So also this question comes up a lot. Why aren't all candidates filing reports at the same time? So again, with this new law, you're only having to file based on that 12 month uh, look back period for your election, right? And so most cities and towns have staggered terms. And so you might have some candidates who are not running for office this year, so they are not having to report. Um, but again, if you're elected this year in August or November, um, at the next cycle, which is 2022, when maybe your other council, you know, men are, and women are going to be actually running for election, but you're not, you won't be having to file a report. So it is based on, again, your specific office for your specific race and not necessarily all candidates in one city or town. Okay, so filing campaign finance reports. So Arizona law has all these categories of everything that you're gonna to have to list in your reports. You know, obviously they wanna know the cash on hand. They wanna know your total receipts, um, your totals for everything. And there's summary sheets for all of these that kind of help you, you do your individual schedules and you total them and then you move that to your summary sheets. Um, and so that helps you kind of calculate everything. And then also you have to certify, of course, um, the treasurer, again, personally responsible, um, custodian of this of this information and so they're gonna have to sign you know under penalty of perjury that the contents are, are true and correct so for the cover page we're still kind of we've kind of finished that reporting period and report due columns and now at the bottom of the cover page there's a kind of a couple different additional rows so one is the current value at the beginning of the reporting period right you need to know you know what your balance is um, and then also there's the total again from that schedule A, which is all your contribution or receipts as a summary page. You're going to take that total and put it in the cover page. And then the same thing for uh, schedule B, your expenditures, disbursements, you know, that final total from that schedule, you'll move over to your summary page. And then there's a row that talks about the balance, right? You obviously kind of your beginning balance and now here's your end balance. And then there's also another box there that talks about no financial activity. Um, that's really if you've had basically not one penny difference from your last report, you can essentially just check that box like you'll fill out everything in the cover page, check that box and then you don't actually have to, uh, you know, do any other schedules. Um, because basically what you're attesting is that there has been absolutely no change in your contributions or expenditures or your balances and so um, you don't have to sort of refile all of those schedules. Um, sometimes that does happen if you, you know, again, if you uh, have had an open committee and it's the beginning of your, your election cycle, right, and you're, you're starting to file and you just kind of been somewhat inactive, you just haven't been revved up yet, and so there just hasn't been any activity. Um, and so that would be maybe an opportunity for you to just kind of check that box. Um, the next page is brand new. It's the signature page. Um, we didn't have this before, but in December, the Attorney General's office um, asked the Secretary's office to put in this page. Um, so you do have to print and sign it now. Before we were just accepting it kind of as, you know, when you emailed it or when you dropped it off, it was deemed received. Um, kind of same as the state with their electronic system, but the Attorney General really wanted uh, a signature. And so we uh, now have to, to, you know, make sure you, you print and sign that um, before you submit it. And then the next two pages, again, you have that summary of receipts page, which is really all your contributions, and then your summary of disbursement page, uh, which is all your expenditures. After those pages, then you start getting into the individual schedules. So that's what we're gonna kind of talk about now. So one is the types of contributions. That's the, the first kind of piece of it. And it's monetary contributions, loans, and in-kind. Those are the three uh, types. So in the first schedule is gonna be, um, individual contributions that are over $50. So you're gonna be reporting, again, we kind of talked about some of that contributor information that you need to obtain. So the, the name, their address, again, not PO box, you really need an address, occupation, their employer. So that information goes into sort of the first box and then you put in obviously what it is, the amount received. Um, there's another one column that says amount received in the reporting period. So maybe, 
you know, right now we're in a reporting period. Um, uh, and let's say you, you received one contribution today and then you also received one maybe a few weeks ago, you know, they decided to give you some more. So both of those need to be reported sort of individually because they're separate contributions, right? But you also need to make sure that they're reflected in that um, amount or reporting period. Um, and then there's also another one that's amount sort of per cycle. So maybe they give you one contribution this reporting period, but they'd also given it to you back in January as well. So a different reporting period, but same cycle. So you're gonna to have to kind of reflect it in each of those boxes. And I did wanna mention, because I know this comes up and it's been frustrating for our candidates, so this form, um, you know, I think they've done the best to uh, sort of reflect what the statute says, because it is required that this information be provided. However, it, it kind of results in what I would say a double counting. Um, and first of all, the state is aware of it, and I think has been. Again, this is one of the things that we'd probably like to change in the form um, after this election cycle. But what can happen is if you have a um, uh, let's say an individual contributor and they give you, um, you know, whatever it might be, let's say $500. Um, and again, let's say it was in uh, April, you know, it's in this reporting period. Um, so, but then last week they just gave you a thousand dollars. So now that's 1500, right? In the same reporting period. Well, again, you have to list that, you know, $500 contribution and all of that information. You're going to have to list separately again, the $1,000 contribution. And then in that sort of amount, you know, in that reporting period, basically you're going to be putting $1,500 in both places. And that can cause a lot of confusion again, because you're looking at it and you're like, well, I didn't get 3000 from them. Cause you know, when you total it, it's going to be an extra $1,500. So there's a couple of things that you can do, um, but it's just going to require you to kind of manually write on your form. Um, you know, you could maybe, you know, go ahead and total it at the bottom as, as it's structured and then sort of put a note in there that, you know, hey, 1500 of this was already accounted for in, you know, box one or box three. Um, or, you know, if you want to put maybe, you know, zero in one of them and say, hey, look above, it's already reflected so that way you're getting the right calculation. It's a bit confusing. And again, I know it's frustrating for everybody um, because, you know, someone who isn't that familiar with this could just look at it and think that your math is all wrong. Um, so again, the state is aware of it. I think this is something that we really need to address uh, hopefully next year when they're revising their manual and revising their forms, that perhaps we can get some opportunity to create a checkbox or something like that. So you can say, no, this was already reflected in a, an earlier part of the, the form. But for now, um, you know, do what you can, do your best. And, and you can always, again, sort of write on it if you, if you want to put something on there to explain uh, why it's, it's not being uh, sort of kind of the, the calculation maybe isn't looking correct. Just so you know, you're only putting the amount received on the actual summary form, which is then being reflected in your cover page. But again, it's just if somebody is looking at your actual individual schedules and see sort of your total reporting and your total for election cycles, sometimes it can get confusing. So sorry, that was long winded, but I, we get a lot of questions about that. So for uh, contributions over $50, I did want to just mention a couple things that have come up. So foreign nationals, you are not allowed to take monies from foreign nationals. Um, now again, you're not required if someone's handing you a check at a you know, fundraiser or something like that to you know, ask for proof of citizenship or confirm immigration status, et cetera. But if you see that the check is uh, drawn on a foreign account, then that should at least prompt you to say, oh, wait, wait, you know what I mean? And just ask the questions. Um, you know, and let them know just state law does not, you know, allow you to accept that contribution. Also joint contributions from spouses. So they each have their own contribution limit, even though they might share a joint account. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. So again, you want to, you know, if a check is written um, from one spouse, you know, apply it to that spouse. But if both, you know, sign it, then you can apply it evenly to both, but they have their own contribution limit. So you know, spouse A has 6450, spouse B has 6450 to give you. Uh, lobbyists, just some local jurisdiction have some restrictions on accepting lobbying contributions. So just something to be aware of. Uh, also minors, if for some reason the minor, you know, wants to provide it to you, then it has to be a contribution from the custodial parent. Okay, so those were contributions of uh, over $50. That's what's required to be reported. 
So what happens if someone, an individual gives you less than $50? Um, well, you don't actually need to report all of that contributor name and address, occupation, et cetera, but you should still keep track of that information again, because if they later down the road give you enough money to go over $50, you're gonna have to report it, uh, all that information. So just, just track everybody in the beginning. Um, but in per, for, in, you know, for the form itself, you don't actually have to provide that information if they give you $50 or less. So you're just going to aggregate. So if you got $20 here and $30 there, and you know what I mean, you're just going to basically add it all up and put it on the form. So that one's fairly easy to, to figure out. So those small uh, contributions, again, if you're, you know, at a big event and there's, there's a lot of things happening and maybe, you know, you're not going to see these people that much. And again, they're giving you $5 or $10 or things like that. Um, you know, again, do your best to try to track that information, but it can get a little bit unruly, sort of the bigger the event is. Um, so, you know, just uh, if you're somebody that you know and you think you might get another contribution from them, you know, make sure you get that information. Um, but I think that the secretary's office, they've provided some guidance. They understand that maybe at some of these larger events, it, it's just almost impossible to, to try to keep track of all of those very small contributions. Okay, so we've gotten two schedules already and now we're on candidate committee contributions. Um, so again, you have to report the committee name and ID number and that should reflect what's listed on their statement of organization. If they don't give that to you for some reason, like maybe you get the committee name but not the ID number, you can look that up. You can ask the clerk for that information. Um, hopefully they're registered. Um, and then contributions from one candidate committee to another candidate committee. So this is allowed, but it has to be under certain requirements. Um, and it's kind of what's known as surplus monies, which are sort of the monies left over when you're terminating your committee. So with the legislature, they were pretty keen on when they actually did this new uh, 2016 law is they didn't want sort of candidates raising money for other candidates. Because let's say you have, um, you're, you're, you know, it's a non-competitive, like it's, it's pretty easy that you're definitely gonna win your race. You know, there's, there's not gonna be any challengers for you. What they didn't want is essentially um, somebody, you know, raising money, but it's not really gonna be going to them. You know what I mean? They're gonna actually be just kind of transferring it over to you. And then essentially that could skirt contribution limits. Um, so they, they were really um, keen on this piece of it, of, of sort of the criteria that you need to meet in order to have sort of candidate contributions. So, uh, or candidate committee contributions to another candidate committee. So again, the first is it has to be, the contribution has to be made after the candidate filing deadline, um, which this year was April 6th. Um, so we're, we are well after that deadline now. And then um, it needs to be made, uh, or it has to be the person who's contributing it, the candidate, has to be in the last year of his or her term and not seeking reelection. So, uh, or maybe they've already left office, but they're, again, they're on their way out, they're terminating. And then they also, uh, kind of as proof of that, they have not filed a nomination paper with any officer to seek reelection. And then it also is subject to contribution limits. So uh, they can't just give you everything. You know, maybe they have $10,000 left over. Well, they can't just transfer that to you. It does have to only be up to $64.50 to that local candidate. So those are the kind of the criteria if another candidate committee wants to provide you with contributions. Okay, so we have a couple of questions with that. Um, so if a city council member is in the final year of uh, her term and she's decided she's not running for reelection, she didn't file nomination paperwork, you know, before the April 6th deadline and it's not going to be on the ballot. So can this council member contribute to another candidate's committee? So yes, right, you kind of checked all the boxes. The member is in the last year of the term. Um, the deadline has passed. They didn't file paperwork to run again or for, you know, or for another office and then they can contribute up to the limit. So again, that's 6450. But let's say that there is a mayor who has a couple years left on his four-year term. Let's say his election isn't this year. It's going to be in 2022. Um, but the April 6th deadline has passed um, and he isn't technically running for a re-election this year. Can he contribute money to another candidate's committee? And the answer is no. So although the deadline passed and it's, he's not up for re-election, he is not in the final year of his term. His term ends in 2022. So he's not able to contribute to another candidate. Okay, so those were the uh, candidate 
committee contributions. Now we're on to PACs. So um, you can accept monies from PACs. Um, again, you just have to report their committee ID number, their name, et cetera. Um, these PACs should be registered. Um, so hopefully, again, it's not something that you have to actually go and check, but you can check. You could always check with the clerk uh, to see if they're registered. Um, and then there's the stuff about mega PACs, which I mentioned before, how they can give double the amount. Um, so you can receive monies from a mega PAC if they provide you with the certification from the state. Um, so we'll talk about it here. So a mega PAC is a PAC um, that's certified by the state because they've essentially received $10 uh, contributions from 500 individuals um, in a four year period. So basically they've kind of certified that they have, you know, a lot of sort of people behind them that are donating to this PAC. And so um, when they go through that certification process at the state, and the state gives them that form that they can use. And so they're able to contribute twice the contribution limit per election cycle. So that's a lot of money. Um, you know, this doesn't come into play very often at our local level. Um, it's, you see it mostly at the state, but certainly it's, it's still an option. I guess if someone wanted to get involved, you can accept money from a mega PAC. Okay. Um, political party contributions. So again, this does not apply to the, the majority of you because uh, our elections are nonpartisan. So it's really only the city of Tucson that has partisan elections. So for this, you would leave that schedule blank. Partnership contributions. So again, maybe you have, you know, a partnership that wants, they want to donate in their name or contribute to in their name. Um, and so you can go ahead and accept it. Um, but that contribution also is attributed to the individual partners. So it's really important that you make sure you know who's, which of the partners are actually donating, right? So maybe there's three partners or however it is, and, but only two are actually going to be contributing. Um, so make sure that you know who it is so that you can allocate that specific amount to each individual and you will have to list them um, in that capacity so you know that you you know, that they're reflected in the report as individual contributions as well. Uh, but sometimes people are just more comfortable giving uh, or contributing sort of in their partnership name. So contributions, LLCs, uh, I'm sorry, corporations, LLCs, and labor organizations. So these are prohibited. Um, so you should not be accepting any contributions from them and these schedules should hopefully be blank. Um, if for some reason that you uh, accidentally receive a, a contribution from a corporation, again, kind of that scenario that I described earlier that you inadvertently kind of had, you know, received that contribution and you didn't realize it was gonna come from the corporation, you thought it was gonna come from your friend, um, you know, as long as it's sort of in your, your account, you need to report it. Um, so you would actually report it on one of those forms. Um, but again, you're going to want to remedy that as soon as possible and, and try to refund that. And then there's another form down the road where you can show refunds. So personal monies. Um, so you do, even though if you're going to give your own monies to your own uh, candidate committee, you, you do need to report it. Um, and this, again, is all your contact information. And then personal monies is pretty expansive. It means assets, salaries, dividends, bequests spousal income, gifts, loan proceeds, and family contributions. So if any of that is tied to, you know, being a contribution to your committee, um, you do have to report it. However, again, as I mentioned, your personal monies are not subject to any type of cap. So, you know, how it's usually 6450 from any individual to a candidate, you can give as much as you want to your committee. So again, this is just kind of the definitions of all the types of personal monies, like I said, the assets, the salary, investments, bequests, so if you get inheritance, um, any type of trust income or personal gifts. Also loans and then family contributions. We're gonna talk more about just loans in general in a moment, but um, just for this particular piece, I wanna be really uh, clear because if you've decided that you're actually giving your campaign a loan, it is personal money, but you're going to need to make sure that you actually document it as a loan because once you terminate your committee, um, you're not able to, you know, surplus monies, if you have anything left over, it's not going to be able to be used for personal use. And so you need to make sure that there's a clear delineation that, hey, maybe I gave, you know, $2,000 of my personal monies, 
but then I gave, you know, $5,000, but this is a loan because, you know, a loan is, is that you expect repayment back. And so you just need to make sure that it's very clear um, in your report that it's actually a loan so that you can essentially again, try to get it back. Um, and then also the last type of personal monies is just family contributions. Okay, so can a candidate loan his campaign money and then pay himself back with contributions? So this is kind of what I just talked about, right? So yes, um, but you're gonna need to make sure that um, there's some sort of criteria that the state has kind of outlined um, that who's gonna be, you know, that basically a loan requires repayment or forgiveness. And so it's still going to be classified as, as personal monies because that's just where it falls in the definition. So when you are on that schedule of personal monies, you're going to want to you know, fill out all that information, but you're going to want to put some type of entry that says personal loan. Um, and then, of course, if any questions came up in a campaign finance you know, inquiry or, or complaint, um, then you just need to provide documentation of why that's a loan. Okay, the next schedule is refunds given back to contributors. Um, so again, if you maybe took a, a prohibited, um, you know, contribution, then you would want to write that there, refunds given back. Um, any type of, you know, excess contribution as well. Um, we'll, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then also if a contribution that has been earmarked by another candidate, um, you know, so you can't basically accept a contribution on behalf of some, you know, like someone says, hey, I want to contribute to this person, but I've already reached my contribution limit. So I'm going to give it to you. And then can you contribute to them? You can't do that. So uh, that's called earmarking and it's just uh, illegal. So um, if for some reason that happened and you misunderstood what the contribution was for, then, you know, you just refund it. And, and again, write it in there of why you're refunding. Um, excess contribution. Let's talk about that because that one's kind of a strange one. So an excess contribution is one that exceeds the contribution limits. So, you know, um, essentially what they have in state law is if a candidate committee is given, um, you know, money is in excess of the contribution, you have 60 days to kind of remedy that contribution by either refunding the amount or um, re-attributing. And that's just kind of this, this new thing that they added in the new law. Um, you can reattribute the amount to the other individual. And this only works if you're a joint account holder. So if you're not, then you can't use it. You just have to refund. But if there's a joint account, you can reattribute. So here's my example to kind of explain it. Um, so spouse A makes a $7,000 contribution to a municipal candidate using a check, has both spouses a joint account holder. So you know it's a joint account. Only spouse A signed the check. Um, there were no previous contributions, but remember the contribution limit is uh, 6450. So they're over. So within 60 days of receiving that contribution, you as a candidate need to contact spouse A and say, hey, you, you've exceeded it by $550. Um, do you want me to refund you or do you want me to reattribute your excess to your spouse? And so if they verbally authorize, oh yeah, go ahead, you know, he or she hasn't given anything to you, so go ahead and reattribute it. Um, then you can go ahead and reattribute. Uh, so you don't need any written documentation. They can just verbally authorize it. Um, so then when you do your report, it's going to show, you know, a 6450 contribution from spouse A, and then you're also going to individually list, you know, spouse B as a $550 contribution. So again, the only way this works is if it's a joint account. If there's no joint account and someone goes over your contribution limit, you just have to refund uh, the remainder. So that's kind of what this says. It's only limited to joint account holders. Okay, so reporting loans, uh, loans received. Um, so loans can be really, I think, complex for a lot of people to try to figure out the repayment. Um, so just be really careful about, again, documenting everything. Um, you know, you usually have um, kind of like the partnership where in the partnership's name, you have, you know, you're, you're essentially reporting what it is that they give you in a contribution, but it also counts against essentially the individual uh, partner. Um, it's kind of the same thing with loans when it comes to endorse, whoever's endorsing your loan. Um, so you kind of have the lender who's giving it you the loan, but you also have the endorser. And so that kind of both counts against their contribution limits. Um, and then as you pay back your loan, the loan balance remains a contribution to the extent that it remains outstanding. And we'll have an example here. 
So if an individual, um, you know, say his friend provides a $5,000 loan to a candidate committee, and then the friend agrees to guarantee the loan, another friend agrees to guarantee the loan on behalf of the committee, the lender and the friend each have um, $1,450 left, right, from that $6,450 uh, to contribute. So that's, again, it's, it's allocated to kind of both of them. So it's a loan and it's reflected on the report as a loan, but then it's also reflected sort of individually in their own capacities. So um, the committee, let's say, repays a thousand of dollars of that. But then now your friend and the lender each have a little bit more to contribute if they, if they so wanted. So just kind of keep in mind that those loans do count against your contribution limit. So there are some loan, uh, some source restrictions to loans. Um, so it's, um, you know, the thing is, remember we talked about how corporations, you cannot accept contributions from corporations. Well, banks are corporations. Um, I think they're generally incorporated. So technically, you're not really supposed to be receiving a loan from your bank. So how for your candidate committee. So what this means is that you're receiving it in your personal capacity, not as a candidate. And then that's when you might be taking that loan um, and giving it to yourself as personal monies. So again, that's when you'd want to write, it's, it would fall on the schedule of personal monies that you would include that information, but you're going to want to write on there somewhere that this is a, you know, a loan. Again, so just that you're documenting because someone is expecting to get repaid. And so that's very different than if you're just donating or contributing your own personal monies. So the next schedule is forgiveness on any loans received. Um, debt forgiveness is the same as a contribution. So you, again, you just want to make sure that if you uh, anybody has said, "Hey, you no longer owe this amount," um, that you're reflecting that on your on your schedule. Same thing with repayments. As you're making repayments, you'll go ahead and uh, uh, put that on your schedule and any interest on the loans. So these are all just things that are pretty self-explanatory when you're actually looking at your schedule of what you need to to provide. And then the last piece of sort of the contributions uh, piece is rebates and refunds. Um, you need to go ahead and identify the original transaction, the rebate or the re refund was received from, and then interest accrued on monies. Again, you just need to, to provide that information if it applies. Okay, so in-kind contributions. So again, get a lot of questions about these. Um, I didn't go into detail as much as you can kind of see, you can see all the schedules kind of lined up with them because it's really almost the same as what we just went through with regular contributions. Um, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things and then we'll talk more about in-kind contributions generally. So in-kind contributions are non-monetary benefits, right? No money involved. It's goods or services or anything else of value that's provided to the candidate committee without charge or maybe at a discount. So um, I'll kind of scroll down here to, um, there's a couple here, like the ones from political parties, obviously, again, would not apply um, to, to the bulk of you because it's only for uh, partisan elections. And then corporations, labor organizations, still prohibited, even though it's in-kind and not money, still prohibited. And then also political parties, there's an additional one for them that does not apply, again, because of uh, you are nonpartisan. So in-kind contributions, um, so for campaign finance reporting purposes, um, your in-kind contribution doesn't affect your committee's cash account. So if you actually look at the schedule, when you actually put it on the summary page, it actually doesn't go into your cash column, it goes into what's called an equity column. And so it's actually not going to be reflected sort of in an amount um, in your actual report. Um, but you do still need to, uh, report what the actual fair market value is of your in-kind contribution. Um, so it's really fair market value is just the price it would cost somebody else, um, such as your opponent to purchase the same good or service. We get a lot of questions on this of how do I determine what the fair market value is. Truly, I would just say if you don't know, um, if someone gives you a good or a service, then, then just kind of call around, you know, try to get a couple estimates from a couple different people for whatever product it is they gave you or service. Um, so you can kind of maybe aggregate that and, and average it out and, and kind of figure out, okay, I, I think I'm fairly certain that this was the fair market value. That's just one idea. Um, hopefully, maybe if, if it's something that someone you know that's given you a good or service, you can just ask them, hey, what would you normally charge? And that should be sufficient. Um, also, the amount of the in-kind contribution has to be equal to the usual and normal charge on the date received and performed. 
Um, and when we talk about this too, we talk about sort of the donated or discounted goods or services. So um, maybe they didn't give you something for free, right? But maybe they give you a, you know, a pretty significant discount. And that could be for, and here's some examples of, you know, some wood or rebar for your yard signs, for printing services, donor lists, uh, designing a campaign website, um, things like that. Maybe you did pay them and that would be reflected in your expenditures, but maybe they give you a discount. And so for, um, you have to figure out what that discount is and that is an in-kind contribution. Um, and you would have to report it. So here's a, a, just a couple questions that sometimes I receive. So if a PAC pays for a candidate, uh, signs for a candidate, is it an in-kind contribution? So yes, right? So the PAC has provided goods to the candidate at no charge, um, and it's non-monetary. So yes, that is an in-kind contribution. So again, the candidate just needs to estimate what that fair market value is and then report on their schedule. So what if a candidate's friend owned the sign shop that gave the package discount on the signs? Is this an in-kind contribution to the candidate? So likely not to the candidate, but it is an in-kind contribution for the PAC, right? So you're still, as the candidate, you're gonna have to still report that you got an in-kind contribution from the PAC for that fair market value, but then the PAC is really uh, responsible to report that they got a discount uh, as an in-kind contribution on their own reporting schedule. So if my candidate committee receives free computer services, does the service have to be reported as an in-kind contribution? So it depends uh, on what are the computer services. Is it a website design? Is it social media messaging? Is it internet access? What, what are the computer services? And I put this question up because it's something that was sent to me um, and it doesn't really have a clear answer. And I, I kind of wanted to put it up on purpose so that you could kind of see how you would walk through the analysis yourself. So when something like this is just you're not sure if it falls into that category, you need to ask yourself, again, go back to the definition of what is an in-kind contribution. Is it a non-monetary benefit? Well, it seems like it's not, right? It's computer service. It's not money, cash, check, anything like that. Is it a service? That's how it's being described, so likely yes. Is it being provided without charge or at less than the usual normal charge? Um, it seems yes, that that's kind of what they're asking, right? They're giving you free computer services. So likely it does need to be reported as an in-kind contribution, unless it falls into an exemption. I know we have to think way back to the beginning of the presentation, but there was at least four slides that talked about what is not a contribution, those are exemptions. And so if this type of situation fits into an exemption, then you wouldn't have to um, report it. But you kind of have to do sort of a two-step analysis. First decide if it's an in-kind contribution, if it meets all of that, and then look to see if it falls in it into any kind of exemption. And in this situation, there is an exemption for volunteer use of email, blogging, social media, other internet activity, if the volunteer is not being paid um, by either you or any other person, um, and the volunteer is you know, not reimbursed, um, and then any type of emails don't contain any type of advertising or sort of um, fundraising solicitation. So again, it's, it's kind of a, a complex situation, and I know this comes up a lot, um, but you just have to do sort of that two-step analysis. First decide, does it meet any, you know, all the factors of an in-kind contribution? If it does, then go look to see if it's exempted in any way. There's not um, a clear answer for some of these, because some of these questions have, have actually shown up on some reports, and people aren't sure, or, or they say, I don't think I have to report it. So, you know, my suggestion is always err on the side of caution, right? Like you don't wanna get a campaign finance complaint filed against you. It's just a distraction if you're trying to run for office, but um, you know, certainly it's your choice if there's kind of some gray area. Um, I would tend to just report it because I mean, why does that hurt to report it versus not reporting it and again, possibly find, being found in violation. So, but I just wanted to try to show you that maybe sometimes there aren't clear answers um, and just the analysis that you need to do as you, as you look at these situations. So if a neighbor hosts a fundraiser for me in their home, do I have to report it as an in-kind contribution for any refreshments that are served? So again, if the neighbor's a volunteer um, and there's, you know, you're not, there's nothing being reimbursed or paid for um, truly a volunteer, then it's not a contribution. And again, it's one of those that falls into an exemption. So 
yes, maybe it would seem to be in kind, but it's exempted. So here's a little bit more about volunteer activity. I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's quite a few. So just take a little bit of time to look through, um, you know, whether or not if people have done sort of favors for you for your campaign of whether or not that falls into any of these um, types of in kind contributions and then also uh, whether or not it's exempt. So a lot of this is just again volunteer services travel expenses uh, use of their property maybe they're hosting a party for you costs of again food invitations beverages. <clears throat> and again here's that email blogging social media Internet activity exemption. Um, and then. They have the definition here of social media messages, just so that you kind of understand what that is, because um, there's a lot of things out there now um, that you can use to kind of promote your campaign. So I did want to have this one ex quick example of volunteer activity. So PAC A, um, you know, Political Action Committee is um, supports political campaigns, and they try to basically connect uh, uncompensated volunteers to opportunities. And so they, the PAC, is hosting a meet and greet with the candidate. Let's say they've invited certain candidates um, to just encourage volunteers to make calls to eligible voters. And so you meet a couple of volunteers, and maybe they're really um, you know, excited about your campaign and they decide that they want to help you. And so they do, the volunteers post flyers, they make some phone calls, they're never reimbursed. So the volunteer services in support of the candidate um, are exempted, right? Because they are truly volunteers. So it is in kind, but then it's exempt. So that does not need to be reported. However, the PAC that sort of hosted this event for you, um, you know, they spent time organizing it and it was a facility rental, they had to pay money for it. So it's sort of the underlying activity is an in kind contribution to you as the candidate. So again, it's a sort of multi layered. Um, and so you just kind of have to go step by step and I'm happy to help is if, if you have questions with these, you know, feel free to just email me directly and we can kind of walk through it. So again, if an attorney is assisting you with a campaign, is this, you know, they're doing it for free, which is very kind of attorneys to do that. Uh, do I need to report this as an in kind contribution. So again, the statute says right that the legal services to your committee is exempted. However, we still have that pending case. So even though, um, you know, yes, it's an in-kind contribution, but yes, the statute says it's exempted. I think for now, you might just want to report it just, just until we get the outcome of that appeal. So is appearing at a business an in-kind contribution? Um, so sometimes, you know, you're invited as a candidate or, um, you know, to come do campaign related appearances at certain organizations. So um, it is likely an in-kind contribution, but it's an exempt one, right? Because as long as the venue was furnished by the owner, so they're not like paying or a third party isn't paying for it. And it's not at sort of one of these sports stadium, coliseum, convention center type of things where they're basically holding a rally for you, right? Um, it's maybe just an operating center of some sort. So that would be fine. That's, that's yes, an in-kind contribution, but you wouldn't have to report it if it meets these exemption uh, criteria. What about elected officials, again, who are on sort of tours and conferences? Because that happens a lot. You're an incumbent um, and you're just doing a normal tour or conference somewhere. Um, so again, it's not, it, it, it might be considered an in-kind contribution, but it's specifically exempt. Again, as long as they're not really kind of hosting you, right? They're not trying to electioneer or have campaign related activity to kind of bolster your candidacy, um, then it's fine. You wouldn't have to report it. But again, you do have to report it on your financial disclosure statement. So that's a different requirement. Um, extensions of credit. So you have to report, um, obviously, all of this information, payments on extensions of credit. Again, this is just back on the normal schedules. And then joint fundraising. <clears throat> so we have this come up a couple times. So your joint fundraising efforts, if you decide you're kind of running as a, as a slate or you're running with a couple other people for the, the three council seats that are open, um, you know, they're permissible, but you need to really flesh it out ahead of time of, you know, when you get the, the contributions, how it's going to be distributed. Um, so, or, and then if you have any payments, because you, you maybe you, you know, rented a space for it, how that's going to be paid. So it's just very important that you get all of that worked out in a written agreement ahead of time. And then as long as you follow that agreement, um, then you should be fine. And then you just have to report sort of your piece of that contribution on the schedule. 
Um, other contributions, so any payments for goods or services, outstanding accounts, uh, transfer of surplus monies. Um, we'll talk more about surplus monies in a minute, and then just miscellaneous receipts. So that's it for contributions on that schedule. And I know that was a lot. That was pretty much the bulk of everything. The next piece won't be as long. It's because um, mainly you're almost kind of just mirroring the same types of things for expenditures and disbursements. So I'm not going to go as much into detail. Um, it's essentially, you know, total disbursements, single disbursements. Um, basically, single disbursements over $250 is what you have to uh, report. Um, but again, you might just want to keep track of everything. I think it's always just best to do that. Um, and then you report totals in each category. Um, and then again, that disbursement uh, of anything to that doesn't exceed 250, you don't have to itemize it, but it's just aggregated on the report. But again, I think you should just keep track. And then uh, obviously all the usual information, right? The name, the date that you received or you sent it, the address, the type of you know, thing that you paid for, all of that. So I did kind of outline it here for you just so you could see it, the disbursements for operating expenses, you know, um, and that's going to be the bulk. That's going to be most of what is going to be in your schedule um, is going to be here. Um, and then obviously if you are making contributions to candidate committees, again, you have to follow that criteria in order to do that. Um, any contributions to PACs, um, again, political parties. I don't know why you do that since you're nonpartisan, but I, um, it's not expressly prohibited. Um, contributions to partnerships, uh, again, corporations, LLCs, and also labor organizations. So um, the secretary's guide has basically said it's not applicable. So again, you really shouldn't have anything in that because you can't receive contributions from them. Um, I think the thought is you shouldn't probably be also giving them monies. And the thing also to consider too, because sometimes people are, are curious or they, they really want to give their monies to other you know, organizations or other PACs or anything like that. So there was a discussion a lot about this, again, with the new 2016 law. And um, there, there's definitely, I think, a prevailing thought out there that, you know, people are giving you contributions for your campaign. And so um, for you to sort of then start giving it away to others, you know, for them, you know, maybe they, they support you and your candidacy, but maybe they wouldn't have supported that PAC or, you know, some other type of organization. And so I think they try to kind of limit it as much as they can so that it's, you know, money's to you for your candidacy. And then again, there's a few few exceptions as long as you follow certain criteria to give to others. Um, so again, loans, kind of the same thing we all talked about. I'm not gonna go in detail, um, but it's basically, again, the reverse. This is just the disbursement. Same thing with in-kind. Again, these are all kind of matching up with the different schedules. Uh, independent expenditures. Uh, we'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, independent expenditure is one that expressly advocates the election or defeat of a clearly identified candidate and is not made in cooperation or consultation with um, uh, the candidate or the candidate's agent. So you really want it to be independent because if it's not, then you have to report it. So that's basically the gist, but we'll talk about it in a second. There's also ballot measure expenditures. So if there's any you know, ballot measures, either on your city or town level that are happening, um, you're going to want to report that. Uh, recall doesn't really apply right now, but you know you would want to report that if that applied. And then also, again, party nominee is not applicable to you. Okay, independent expenditures. So there's nothing like inherently wrong with independent expenditures, or even you know if you're going to, it's not independent, but it's just about when you have to report it. So expenditures by an outside group that are advocating for a candidate's election. Um, or maybe they're trying to, you know, defeat a, a candidate, they're assumed to be independent. That's sort of the presumption. However, um, when this usually comes up is when there's a complaint filed um, alleging that, say, you as the candidate um, has been coordinating with uh, maybe a PAC to oppose your, can you know, your opposition, you're essentially, you know. So there's been some independent operator, what we think is an independent operator, let's say it's a PAC, that's been sending a lot of flyers um, to oppose uh, basically the person that you're running against. And then someone alleges, hey, you know what? I don't see anything in your reports about it, but I know you've been coordinating. So this is kind of the analysis that would have to be done to see is there coordination between you as the candidate and that PAC to sort of defeat your opponent. Um, so these are the things they would look at. Is there actual coordination um, or 
you know, is the pack operating on information that, you know, they wouldn't have gotten except from you. And this is usually when you're getting maybe a lot of flyers in support of you, right? Um, that maybe, how do they know all this information that would have been so helpful? And, and so anyway, this is the analysis they kind of look at. If either condition exists, um, then it's gonna be coordinated. And then it's an in-kind contribution to you. So that's why it matters. Um, so it's more about the reporting aspect of it and that if you really are coordinating with somebody, it just needs to be reflected as an in-kind contribution. Otherwise, if you're coordinating and it's not reflected in your report, then um, they can file a complaint against you. So these are sort of kind of more in-depth things that you need to look at about independent expenditures if you're interested in it. Um, but essentially this is kind of what requires, you know, or what creates the presumption of coordination. And it's important to create a firewall if you have, and this usually happens more at the state level, but you know, sometimes you have people in, in like sort of the same agencies or same consultants. Um, and so yes, they are helping candidate A um, and not candidate B. And so you have to create a firewall. So this probably isn't gonna apply too much to you, um, but just want you to have the information there in case it does. Okay. Um, disbursements continued. It's just, you know, again, your joint fundraising, there, there's a schedule for that. Reimbursements, accounts payable, all of these, again, are kind of just mirror the uh, contributions. So I did have a question about, can I use committee monies for an election night party? Um, I didn't find any specific prohibition for that, but again, you'd have to report it. So probably be an operating expenditure of some sort. Um, what about if a PAC circulates petitions? Is that considered a contribution that has to be reported? So yes. So if you're paying an individual to um, you know, circulate nomination petitions and get signatures for you, then yes, that, I mean, you'd have to reflect that on your report. So penalties for late or incomplete reports. So we've talked a lot about all the reporting. Um, so when it comes down to it, you know, you file your report and, it, and let's say you don't file in a timely manner, right? You, all those deadlines are listed and you miss it. So if that happens, the clerk has, um, has to send you written notice. Um, and again, they're gonna be contacting your treasurer by email within five calendar days after that deadline to let them know that you failed to file your report and what the penalties are. So it's gonna have the $10 per day for the first 15 days and then $25 per day thereafter if the report's not filed. Um, and then you know, the clerk will provide you with, here's methods of payment. So again, the financial penalties just accrue until you file your report. Um, if you don't file within 30 days after the deadline, the clerk may refer it to the city or town attorney for enforcement. And that can essentially ultimately lead to, um, if you don't pay, um, you know, liens, that type of thing. And it, it may not affect you this run or this go around, but you know, if you reach like $1,000 where there's like a lien or a judgment against you relating specifically to campaign finance uh, penalties, then you can't run for office in the future. So it, it does sort of, I guess, catch up to you if you don't pay. So that's pretty much it for reporting. Um, committee transfers, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about because there's some questions about that. So there's different types of transfers between committees for the same candidate. So you can transfer uh, to the same municipal office, which really is mostly um, continuing the use of your own existing committee and not forming a new one, you know, kind of from cycle to cycle. Um, you can transfer to a different office, municipal office, and then transfer to a county or a state, but with restrictions. So um, the candidate is permitted to use their funds for the same office, right? So it's you as the candidate and you're receiving funds into another um, committee for you, right? This is not a different candidate, this is you. Um, so you're not required to terminate and reorganize, right? From cycle to cycle, you can just go ahead and keep that open. Um, the next is a different municipal office. Again, you can transfer some funds, um, but you do have to have some, um, you still have to follow all the laws applicable to obviously your contributions and reporting and transfers and all of that. So it is possible, um, but you just have to kind of make sure that you follow those, those protocols. And then also, this is the thing that you have to remember that gets really complicated sometimes. So if you're transferring monies from one account to another, you still need to be keeping track of those individual contributions, right? So if somebody, um, you know, my council committee gave me $5,000, um, 
but I had a, you know, another committee that I've opened and they've already given me, you know, $2,000. Well, remember, they can only give sixty-four fifty in that election cycle. So if we're in the same cycle, they you can't just transfer it all over. It has to, you know, only transfer what's going to equal the sixty-four fifty. So just keep that in mind that you have to keep track of who's contributing again, not to skirt the contribution limits. So also for county office, if you decide that you want to run for a county office, you can certainly transfer funds there. Um, you know, you just have to filing officer changes. Um, so you're going to have to go ahead and count, contact the county to, to get that form and get those committees open um, in order to go ahead and, and uh, uh, move that money over. And then also state or legislative office. So this again changed a few years ago. You can transfer monies, but not directly. So what you have to do is transfer to a committee for a county first. You have to open a county committee. You have to let your money sit there for two years, and then you can transfer that money into a statewide or legislative committee. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't open a state or legislative committee. You can certainly do that at any time, um, but you just can't transfer your local monies directly there. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely been a point of contention for obviously our local candidates. Uh, who might be looking at higher office, um, but there's been a lot of discussion because if you look at it, if you look at the, the Secretary of State's contribution limit form, that link that I, I provided, you'll see that uh, local candidates get 6450, whereas the state and legislative get less. I think it's at 5,000 or 5,100 right now. And the reason is because they're subject to the State Clean Elections Act, whereas we're not. And so they have a 20% a drop in what their limit is, and, and it does not affect you. And so I think there is concerns and questions that people didn't want sort of someone to be raising all this money in a local committee and then sort of transferring it later to a statewide committee. So you have to kind of park it for two years in a county, I guess, to show that you're really serious, and then move it over to a state or, le or legislative committee. So, um, you know, something we've worked on legislation wise to see if we can try to change or adjust. And so that's still kind of a work in progress. Advertising and disclosure. Um, so campaign advertising. So any advertisement or solicitation has to have a disclaimer that it was paid for and authorized by the candidates committee. So example, you're going to want to say paid for by Smith for House authorized by Smith for House. And I know that sounds redundant but you just need to say it. Um, that's the full disclaimer. And if you don't, I mean, you, what we've seen, people will file a complaint against you and you'll have a violation. So it's just, it's just worth it to go ahead and put the disclaimer on. And that um, you know, it goes on any type of advertisement. So that's you know, social media um, and other types of broadcast. And we'll kind of go more into it here. So fundraising, um, it has to be clearly readable, right? So if you have something printed materials, make sure that they can clearly see it. It is an itty bitty print at the bottom. And then um, it has to make sure that it's, you know, it kind of is dependent on, on how it's, it's conveyed. So if it's a broadcast on a radio, then it's gonna have to be clearly spoken at the beginning or end of the advertisement. Um, if it's again printed, delivered by hand or emailed, it has to be clearly readable. If it's on a sign or a billboard, it has to have some height restrictions it meets. And then broadcast on television, again, it has to be written or spoken at the beginning or end of the advertisement. Um, and then also printed in a certain you know, uh, requirement of at least 4% of the vertical picture height. So uh, just keep that in mind. And then there is kind of an exception for certain social media because sometimes social media, text messages or other kind of like short audio messages if you have that whole disclaimer, it almost takes up your entire message, right? Um, so if they're gonna be really short like that, then you don't have to have the disclaimer on there, but you know, you're gonna really wanna be able to justify that oh, that was a really short message service and that's why I didn't put that disclaimer. Um, advertisements that are on um, like a link to a website, I mean, that's okay as long again as it goes to a website that contains that actual disclaimer. So you're gonna always link back to something that has the disclaimer. And then advertisements that are placed as a graphic or picture link, again, um, you just wanna make sure there's something that they could click that it could get back to that disclaimer. Um, anything that's really small, bumper stickers, pins, button pens, things like that, where again, you just can't even fit that information, you, you don't have to worry about that. 
terminating a committee. So I often get this question, when do I terminate? Well, there's no set requirement for when you have to terminate, um, you know, as long, but as long as the committee is open, you are subject to reporting requirements. So if you decide to terminate, and sometimes people do at the end of, you know, election cycle, they're not going to run for re-election again, they just decide I'm done, I don't want to do it. So um, you would go ahead and essentially terminating means you're ceasing all campaign activity, and then your bank has to, account has to be zero, which is reflected in your reports. So if you have debts, so maybe people have given you some loans, you can't just close without repaying those debts. Um, and sometimes that's where people start doing fundraising to retire their debt. So it's after the election and yet they're still holding fundraisers. That's fine. I mean, if that's again, in order to kind of uh, lower your debt payment. And then again, debt forgiveness. Um, there could be a, a situation that, you know, matches that basically you've been forgiven that debt. And so again, you'd have to reflect that in your report. So we talked a little bit about surplus monies. And again, that's if you happen to have any monies that remain after you're done with all of your accounting, right? So all of your committee's expenditures have been paid. There's no more debts. Um, you're not accepting any more contributions. You're basically ready to close out and you have extra money. So you can transfer again that surplus to a candidate committee organized by the same candidate. Um, you can return those monies to an original contributor. You can always refund, right? Uh, you could also contribute those monies to a PAC or political party within contribution limits. Uh, you can contribute those to another candidate under certain circumstances, right, uh, which we've talked about. And then you could always donate to a nonprofit that meets a certain IRS designation. So again, this is where I kind of mentioned it before. However you decide to, you know, to dispose of your surplus, they cannot be used for personal use. So if you've loaned yourself money, make sure it's reflected so that you get paid back that loan. Um, and then once you terminate, basically you've kind of zeroed everything out, you're required to file a termination statement. And then you've essentially are agreeing that there's, you're no longer gonna be receiving any contributions or making expenditures. You have no outstanding debts um, or they've been forgiven. Um, all your surplus monies have been disposed of. You have no cash on hand. And then uh, basically you've, you've filed your final report. And on your cover page of your report form, there is a specific checkbox for your final report because um, maybe you're not going to be filing within a specific period. So the filing officer, the clerk, can actually reject your statement if um, all these above requirements are not satisfied. So just make sure, again, that everything is taken care of before you come in to file that statement. Um, once it's accepted, you are no longer required to file any reports. So quickly, I just wanted to talk about um, the campaign finance process. I'm not going to go into all of this, but I'll ha I have it all here for you so you can look at it. So uh, the one thing I wanted to say is that um, the clerk is not allowed to sort of investigate on their own. Um, sometimes people just call and they're like, hey, can you look into this? The clerk can't do that. So this was again part of that change in 2016. If you want an investigation, then it needs to be a third party written complaint. And you really should have, you know, recite all the facts of what it is that the violation is, you know, try to provide the statutes if you can, um, identify who's involved, if there's any supporting documentation for that. And then also, um, you know, differentiate if this is just something that you think you, you know, you heard from somebody else or if it's based on personal knowledge. So all of that helps facilitate the complaint process. The less information you give the clerk, I mean, it's just much more difficult for them to actually, you know, investigate. But I did want to stress that they, they can't just initiate an investigation on their own. So if you're just kind of emailing and saying, hey, look into this, look into this, I mean, they can try to, you know, probably respond back to you and say, hey, can you provide all of this information that I just listed? But um, you really need to be as helpful as possible if you truly want them to have a robust investigation. And all of this whole complaint process that I have outlined here is from the Secretary of State's um, Election Procedures Manual that was approved by the Attorney General. So there are some deadlines in here just to take a look at. Um, if it's sufficient um, and they decide to investigate, like the complaint is, is you know, complete, um, then they'll go ahead and they'll um, determine if there's reasonable cause. There is no really set definition for what reasonable cause is. They're basically trying to determine is there reasonable cause to find that there's a violation of campaign finance law. So the clerk does their best with the information that's provided to them. Um, and then at that point, if they do find reasonable cause, it's forwarded to the um, uh, 
enforcement officer, which is the city or town attorney. So sorry, I'm going through these a little fast, but this is just kind of walking through that process. So, and then the enforcement officer makes the final determination of whether the violation occurred, um, or maybe they were, may need some more investigation. Um, if there is a campaign finance violation and it's not remedied after they've notified you within 20 days, then they can initiate legal action uh, to secure compliance. So just keep that in mind. Violations and the penalties are just kind of based on what the actual um, complaint is about and how much money is involved. Um, so also there is just something for you to be aware of. There are also criminal penalties, um, kind of in a different section outside of campaign finance law, but related. So just for example, a candidate committee may not knowingly accept a contribution in the name of another person. Um, so that actually is not monetary penalties, although it might have some, it's actually a classic felony. So those are uh, just some other things to kind of be aware of. Okay, so I think that's it. I know that was a lot of information. I know you have a lot of questions and we're already at noon, but I'm willing to, to answer as many as I can. All right, uh, thank you, Christina. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Just making sure, okay. Well, thank you very much. I, I know it was uh, uh, a long presentation, but uh, a lot of really good information. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go through the questions that have been asked in the Q&A. And for those of you, we know we're at the lunch hour. If you have to get off, we are gonna send this presentation, uh, the recorded presentation, as well as her PowerPoint um, and CLE forms out to all those who had, uh, signed up for this. So you will receive that probably later today or early tomorrow. So with that, we will start with the questions. Um, the, the first question, and some of these you might have already answered, Christina, but I'm just gonna go through each one. First question is, does a candidate need to register a committee if they claim they will be paying for all their campaign throughout the election process and will not be receiving any contributions and their expenditures exceed the $500? Okay, so yeah. So I think I, I did kind of touch on that. Um, so if you, if the, your personal monies are still contributions. And so you can give as much as you want without, you know, contribution limits, but it is still subject to that threshold. And yes, you still have to register and report it. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I was appointed to my current position. If the election I am running for is in two years, can a statement of organization be filed at any time, assuming I would receive $500 to meet the threshold? Yes. So anytime, really, anytime you hit that threshold, it's 10 days that you have to go and you actually have to file. So it might not be in sort of your election cycle, but you, you are required to file within 10 days. All right, next question is, I live in a town with only a P.O. box. Can I still use that? So that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think if that's all you have, you can certainly put that, but you might want to put maybe some cross streets or something else. Um, so the secretary's guide is it's what actually said that you have to put all of that a street address. I think that the statute says it has to be a physical location or street address. So <clears throat> I guess you could just maybe try to put some landmarks, which I know we've done with voter registration before with, with uh, especially out in like the tribal areas, they only have PO boxes. And so um, I think if you have that situation, you might wanna put your PO box, but also maybe like a, you know, cross street or physical location of some sort. Okay, next question is, what if I charge an item for my campaign and then have the campaign write a check to cover it? Which date do I use? Okay, so can you say it again, charge an item? Yeah, what if I charge an item for my campaign and then have the campaign write a check to cover it? Which date do I use? Okay. Um, I'm not sure that I completely understand the question. <laughs> so I think you probably want to go back and look at the slides that talk about the, um, you know, kind of like what's deemed an expenditure at what time. Um, and just to see if maybe that was answered. And then if not, I would say email me. That way I can ask you some more questions. Great, thanks. And yeah, just for anybody uh, else too, um, as you can see, uh, Christina's uh, email is up on the uh, screen right now. So you, if you do have questions after this that come up or you uh, have further questions, please do feel free to email Christina. Uh, the next question is, I have a candidate I have candidate signs from a previous election, which I would like to reuse. 
They were declared as expenses in the reporting for the previous candidate committee, which is now closed. I do not intend to open a new candidate committee. Would reusing these signs, which have already been paid for, count as an expense for this new election? So, I mean, my understanding is that you've already paid for them and they've already been reported, then I don't think you have to report them again, which is kind of what I think you're asking because, um, or that you even have to create a committee um, in order to report them. So, uh, I mean, my understanding is really, if, if again, if they've already been paid for by your previous committee and they've been, um, and this is the same committee, I guess, is what, I just wanna make sure it's the same committee and it's not a different one. If it's the same, then yes, you could, I mean, I think you can use them and you don't necessarily have to report them. They've already been reported. But if it was, I would just kind of clarify though, because sometimes this happens where maybe you get supplies, campaign supplies from a different committee, that would be an in-kind contribution, you know, or for, from somebody else that you would have to report. So just make sure that it's, again, you as the candidate and you haven't changed, you're still, it's your, your campaign signs and you're using them again for yourself. Okay. Next question is, please clarify whether to use the date on the check first the date versus the date you make deposit into your bank account. Okay, I think that's one you're going to have to email me <laughs> just because I don't know what the context is. Because the information that I provided on the slide is literally just from the Secretary of State candidate guide and the statute. So I think maybe we need to have more discussion. Okay. Uh, next question is, if you have expended personal monies, can you reimburse yourself from the campaign account? So you can if it's, again, like we were talking about the loans. Um, so you can go ahead and, and if it's like you're loaning yourself money, then, you know, make sure it's reflected in your report. And then that's something that essentially is a repayment that you owe. And so then your committee monies as you're fundraising, you can pay back that loan. But I'm not sure that if you could just you know, basically contributing personal monies that essentially you can give it back because at the end, when you're terminating, you can't use your, per, you know, nothing, those surplus monies can't be used for personal use. So I can really only see the only way is if it's a loan. Okay, next question. Does the cost of the checks for my campaign account go on the financial report? So really it's anything that you're purchasing. So if you're, you know, it, whatever it is that you might be purchasing for your campaign would be reflected on, on, your, on your reports. So anything, pens, paper, checks, yeah. Excellent. Uh, next question, what is cryptocurrency? That's a good question. <laughs> it's like this uh, kind of virtual, you know, it's Bitcoin and things like that. I, I really don't have a lot of information about it. It's just um, more like, money is that it's not actual money in your hand it's more like virtually kind of deposited into accounts i'm sure somebody could explain it better than me but we've actually had a couple of candidates who've asked if they can accept it and there's no guidance so that's why i was saying just just be cautious about it all right next question can contributions be made via third-party tools such as paypal or venmo I assume this would still fall under online payment or electronic transfer, and the account would be in the committee's name. Sure, yeah, that's fine. you can go ahead and use, um, yeah, those, those uh, kind of uh, operating systems or whatever they are. And, and, uh, and then if you have processing fees and things like that for that too, that you might actually want to be able to reflect as, um, in your report as well um, as expenditures. So, but you can absolutely use those, yes. Next question. In in-kind contributions like food for a special event donated by a restaurant, which is a corporation, is that okay? So, no, I mean, you're not supposed to be receiving anything from a corporation at all. Um, so I don't know if it's maybe like there's a volunteer who picks up some food from an organization or something like that, but you're not supposed to be receiving anything directly from a corporation. Okay, next question. What to do with unexpected contributions at the end of the election cycle if I don't plan on running again? Um, so you can do a couple things. Um, so you can either just refund them, the money back, um, or if you're terminating your committee, 
those will be surplus monies. And then you have some of those other options. So you could donate to a nonprofit. Um, you could donate to another candidate committee. So um, I would look at the surplus monies spreadsheet or slide, and then it'll kind of give you some options. Okay, next question. Do all pages in the report have to be filed even if they do not apply to the committee or just the pages that contain information? Um, I would check with your clerk just to see what they prefer. I don't think that you would have to file it because it's a lot of paper. I mean, as you saw, there's a lot of schedules. Um, so to me, if it doesn't apply, I don't know why you would include it because it's going to be reflected on your actual summary pages, whether or not there's something, you know, that you have to report. So if all of those are zero, um, I don't know why you'd have to include a blank page. Um, but again, I would just check with the clerk just to see what they prefer. Next question, for the signature on the campaign finance report form, can an electronic signature be used or is it a wet, si or is a wet signature required? Yeah, so that's, like I said, new just since December. Um, I believe they actually want a wet signature just because of the way that they, um, you know, typically, like before that, we weren't even requiring a signature and the statute actually doesn't require a signature. So um, this is, again, the AG wanted this, this signature page. I think they want you to sign it. But, you know, I, if you have an electronic, they're, they're taking that more and more these days. So again, maybe that's also a clerk preference. You might just want to see if they're okay taking it um, digitally. Next question. Uh... I received signs from a sign maker as an in-kind contribution. How do I report it? Okay, so you go ahead and just um, actually in the schedule for the in-kind contribution, you would want to make sure again that you uh, got the fair market value. So you can just ask that sign maker, hey, what would you normally charge somebody for this? Um, and then that's what, what how you would report it. And again, the in-kind contributions aren't going to show up on your cash balance. They're kind of in the equity column. So they're reported, but it's not going to sort of affect your actual overall balance. Okay, next question is, if we had deposited personal money into a campaign account, knowing that there was a contribution coming, and once it's deposited, can you be reimbursed for the money you initially deposited? Yeah, no, I don't so, um, I mean, again, you can contribute as much personal money as you'd like, um, but unless it's a loan, there's really no way, like a mechanism for you to sort of get repaid from your committee monies. Uh, just to clarify, open candidate committees do not need to report during candidate election years unless they are running for office. Correct. Right. So there's that kind of like three year gap almost. So it's really just that 12 months preceding your election is when you have to report. Okay, next question. How are in-kind or discounted printing services not a corporation or LLC? Can you say that again? How, How are in-kind or discounted printing services not a corporation or an LLC? I think it depends on who it is you're getting it from. I mean, I, I'm not really sure. A lot of times people seem to get um, sort of discounts on services from friends. You know, it's just kind of what they're, how their friends are giving them, um, or maybe they themselves, you know, have our own business, that type of thing. And I don't know how exactly they're incorporated or if they're incorporated. So um, I, all I can tell you is just what the, the law says is that you can't accept anything from corporations. What if you paid for something using your personal credit card and should have paid for it using your campaign credit card? How do you rectify this? Hmm. Well, I guess you would probably want to, um, you're gonna wanna document everything, you know, about what there was a mistake that was made um, and then probably try to reflect, I'm trying to think how you reflect on the reporting. Um, hmm. That is a good question. You know what, I might need to look into that one. How about you email me and then I'll chat with the state as well just to see if they've had that come up. Yeah. Okay. If the candidate builds their own website, is this an in-kind personal donation? Well, I think if you have the skills to create the website, um, I don't, I'm just trying to think if it's an in-kind. I mean, it's non-monetary, it's not good or, it's a good or service. 
But if it's yourself, I don't know how you would actually report that. <laughs> that's a good question. Maybe that's what you need to follow up also in kind, yeah. Okay. Next question. Is it legal to transfer funds from your own trust account into your campaign account? Um, so I think the trust is considered personal monies. So I believe you can. I think that was one of the personal money types that I listed. Um, but again, if you're putting personal monies in, I would not expect that that's going to be repaid unless it's a loan. Okay, this is a question about in-kind contributions. A newspaper offered to put my info into their paper. However, one of them that runs it is also running for office. How does this work? Um, so probably if you know, you're getting, um, I don't know what you mean by information, I guess. I don't know if it's like a news story or if it's just like a candidate guide. Again, you just want to make sure that everybody's treated the same, right? That it isn't sort of a campaign piece for you, like that they're advertising or uh, trying to highlight you. If it's something that, you know, maybe once a month they're, they're you know, talking to all the candidates, like it's a series or something like that. Like I would just ask some questions from them of what exactly it is that they're doing, what's the purpose, um, just to make sure you have a comfort level that it isn't, again, um, you know, something that's specifically highlighting you as a candidate that then would have to be an in-kind contribution. So I would ask more questions first, and then you can get back to me. Okay, next question is, what if you belong to a club that you pay dues for, and they recognize you at their monthly luncheon? Do you need to report what you paid for the luncheon that day? If you pay $5 to rent a table to display your petition, do you report that? Well, I think you probably report the table fee anyway, just because it's like has an operating expense. Um, but in terms of the recognition, I mean, I think that's fine. If obviously you're, you know, attending something and people are going to let you know that you're running for office, that type of thing. Um, the difference is more when they're hosting, right? They're hosting an event for you and they've paid, you know, money for a facility and for the beverages and everything else. That's kind of the distinction. That's when it would be more an in-kind contribution. Okay, the next question is, if you pay an annual membership fee to belong to a group, do you need to prorate the amount once you file as a candidate? Hmm, prorate. Um, I guess I don't understand. Like if you have an annual membership somewhere, I mean, it doesn't necessarily change just because you're a candidate. Maybe that's when I think I need more information. If you can email me directly and I can help you with it. Okay, next question. Do you need to report donations to another candidate for a different office for $50 or less? So, you know, you don't report anything, obviously that is $50 or less. It's you're only reporting the amounts on the actual schedule. But as I mentioned a few times, you're gonna to wanna to still keep track of it internally because if then you donate more and you go over the $50 or they donate more to you, um, then you are gonna to have to have all of that information reported, the contributor information. So it's just more of, it's easier to get all that information at the beginning. And then on the actual report form, it would just be the amount. And then if you ever go over that amount, that's when you'd actually report the contributor information. Okay, the next question is, if you have a small flyer, do you have to say on that flyer, quote, paid for and approved by, approved by the candidate's name? Or if you have a window sticker on your car, does it have to say paid for by? And what if it was an in-kind donation? So I would advertise it. You kind of have to be sort of reasonable about it, right? Like if you can fit the disclaimer on there, um, then I would do it. You know, but again, if it's so small that it, people aren't even going to be able to read it, then it kind of defeats the purpose. And there is that kind of exemption in the statute that, you know, if it's, you know, a button or a sticker or something like that, and maybe even a decal might fall into it, depending on the size, um, then you probably wouldn't have to put that disclaimer on there. I mean, hopefully you'd want to at least include your website address anyway, just so that way people could go there. And then on that, you know, your website, you can have the disclaimer. Um, as for the in-kind contribution, can you say that last part again, Matt? Do they just say? It? Uh, yes. So it said, um, if you have a window sticker on your card, does it have to be paid for by? 
And what if it was an in-kind donation? Okay. Uh, so if you receive goods and services, this is the one thing I want to convey. Just because you receive goods and services, it's okay. You just have to report it, right? And so it sounds like if someone donated that for you, uh, for your campaign, then that is a non-monetary good that was given to influence an election. So it's in-kind and you should just report it unless it meets one of those exemptions. Um, I don't know that this one would, um, so likely you would have to report it. Okay, next question. Our campaign has received contribution from a local resident via a check that has a business name on it. It was signed by the individual. There is no indication on the check that the business is a corporation or an LLC. Can we keep the contribution? So this is where you might want to just um, check with them you know, and ask and just say, hey, I, I you know, noticed that it was written on this business. You know, we're not allowed to accept, you know, corporate uh, monies. I just want to make sure this is drawn on, you know, your personal monies account, not your corporate. I would just say, ask them some questions. If they, obviously it is a corporation, um, then you would have to refund it, but hopefully they maybe will be able to, you know, send it to you on a, as a personal check. Okay, the next question. So if I'm funding my own campaign to remain under the $500 threshold, I'm essentially limited to spend $250, $250 of my own money towards $250 in expenditures. Is that correct? Uh, about once you hit $500, that's when the, it triggers. So I guess it's technically, you know, 250 and 249 or something like that. But yes, that's pretty much what it is. It's in any combination of contributions and expenditures that reach $500. Uh, next question. If I have legal costs related to a candidate challenge that exceed $500, do I, have, do I have to have a candidate committee? Oh, that's a good one. Um, if you have not had any other contributions or expenditures, and then obviously your legal challenge came up, see, normally that would not be a contribution um, or expenditure because it was exempt in the state law. But that's where that case is pending. And so that provision of the law has been enjoined, which means it's just not in effect. So that exemption's not in effect. So I hate to say this, but you might need to talk back to your, 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 your lawyer again and just see if, if they think that you should actually report it. Um, that's a bit frustrating, though, if you don't really have anything else to report and now you have to file a committee just to report it. So. For that one, you might want to just ask for some legal advice before you go through that whole exercise. Next question. If we paid for something out of our personal account and recorded on an invoice that campaign owe personal candidate so much money, this is a loan. Is there a deadline for how soon this needs to be repaid? No, I mean, with uh, your loans, they're essentially, you know, you owe that money um, until it's paid. There is a provision that says after five years, <clears throat> you can forgive the loan. Um, but again, you'd have to have that committee open that whole time and be reporting and all of that until you get that loan forgiven. So, but there isn't like a specific deadline uh, of when to repay, but it is on you to eventually repay. Okay, next question. How do you handle candidate out of pocket receipts prior to contributions coming in? Yeah, so this is where it, um, you just have to start keeping track of everything from the beginning. So even if you, you know, don't think you're going to hit the threshold and you're not going to have to register, it's just really best for you to just keep track of everything at the beginning. So everything you spend, everything you take in, who's given it to you, you almost kind of just have to operate as though you are going to have to register because if you don't, um, it's much harder for you to have to go back because you are going to have to go back and sort of construct it in order to report it on that first report. Okay, next question. Clarification. If we are doing social media, we are exempt from having to put paid for by? Question mark. So I think it depends on what it is that you're doing. You know, so um, I think certain social media, you'd be able to probably just put the disclaimer on, no problem. Um, you know, maybe there's other ones that you're using that aren't. So I think it just depends. Really that advertising and disclosure statute 
they want you to put the disclosure. So really the exemptions are for those situations where it's just, it's not allowable because of the, the medium or because of the, uh, obviously the, the small, you know, kind of button stickers, that type of thing. So I would always err on, if you can put it on there, I would do it. Um, and then kind of look at if you feel like you can't, if there's some type of caveat in there that kind of, you know, an exemption that you can use. Okay, next question. People have written contribution checks at our fundraiser and put them in a contribution jar. The only information I have is the name and address on the check. Do I need to contact them to get occupation and employer? Yes, so you at least need to make one attempt because um, the Secretary of State, you know, they, they require at least that you make your best effort. So again, maybe you mail something to them um, if you have their name and address um, or give them a call and leave a message and say that you're required to have that information um, and then just document that you made that call when and where. And that's really just to protect you. I mean, one, it is required by state law that you are supposed to have that information. So if someone files a complaint against you that you're not filling out this information, you at least wanna be able to show that you made your best efforts to comply. Okay, the next question. Is it the clerk's responsibility to ensure my report is completed accurately and or offer guidance on completing a campaign finance report? Uh, no. So remember that state law says it's your treasurer who's actually responsible. They're personally and legally responsible. They're the custodian of your records. They have to approve all your transactions. So your treasurer is the one who's responsible. Uh, the clerk is just the filing officer. They're going to, you know, just be accepting what you give them. And again, they're not going to investigate anything unless a third party complaint is filed. Uh, next question, ARS 16-925 uh, states that in the disclosure, it must say paid for by committee name, authorized by candidate name. Your slide says paid for by committee name, authorized by committee name which is correct. Well, I would go with the statute. I know I got that example from the Secretary of State's uh, guide. So, but I would probably just follow the statute if there's any difference. Followed by the, okay. So it's just followed by the identity of the authorizing candidate. So yeah, I would go ahead and just put the candidate name. Next question. We have had a contribution uh, envelopes placed in a campaign jar at a fundraiser. At the end, when we opened the envelope, there was perhaps $100 in cash in the envelope with no indication of who con contributed it. Do we just report the aggregate of these contributions with no indication of where they came from? Well, I guess if you can't, con you know, if there's really just no mechanism to, to, you know, identify who the contributors are, then yes. I mean, I think you'd probably just put it. I would suggest, though, that, you know, kind of moving forward, you know, that you don't have sort of that jar, you know, or you have at least somebody there monitoring it to make sure that there's a name and address on each envelope um, or contact information so that, that you can get back to them later. Okay, next question. If a local PAC promotes specific candidates via a website, do the candidates have to report that as a contribution? Um, so that's where it's a little tricky. So if it's truly a PAC, like it's a political action committee, um, it seems like that would be some type of in-kind contribution, but a lot of it depends on what it is that they're doing. You know what I mean? Is it, um, if it's on their website, you know, sometimes people have like scrolling kind of social media and they're just retweeting things. Other times maybe it's much more in depth. I mean, it kind of depends on what it is, the content. Um, and then also you do want to verify that it's an actual pack. If it's a pack, it seems like it would be an in-kind contribution. Okay, next question. We already have a committee. We want to know if we can reimburse as a loan. So if you have a committee, um, I'm not sure I totally understand. So if you have a committee open and you want to reimburse a loan, if you have the funds to do that, you certainly can. So there's not like a start or stop point. Um, you know, you can start repaying back any loan whenever you have the funds available. Okay, next question. Do we pay the committee out of contributions? Pay the committee out of contributions. So you're only using committee monies for anything related to the committee. So, um, you know, 
contributions that are coming in, you know, anything you're paying out should only be committee money. So just, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but I would just say make sure that you don't ever commingle, right? You don't want to get your personal monies like from your personal account involved. So um, yes, just make sure that you, whatever it is you're paying for, for your committee is using committee monies. Okay, next question. If you bought signs with your personal credit card before you had a debit card, can you write a check from your campaign account to yourself? Hmm. See, that's a good question. So some of these, I'm not thinking that there's any specific prohibition, except, you know, you're again, you're not really supposed to be using committee monies for things, but it is for a committee purpose. So I'm thinking it's okay, but if maybe you can email me and then I can follow up because this is one I probably want to check with the state. Okay, just to confirm, there is a quarterly campaign report due at the end of June and then a pre-election report due July 17th. So the report is actually due July 15th because it's going to be um, the end of quarter through June 30th. So April 1st through June 30th. And then your next report is you're going to be your pre-election report. And that one is due July 27th. So you're going to have two reports due in July, the 15th, that's going to be covering through June 30th. And then you're going to have the one on the 27th that's going to cover through July 18th. Okay, Christina, I think that is the end of our questions from the Q and A. Okay. So we made it. Um, you know, once once again, thank you very much, Christina, for being willing to do this. And thank you all for uh, your attendance. And uh, we know it was long, but this is a lot of uh, information. And uh, we really appreciate your patience. And uh, we appreciate uh, all your help. And Christina, thank you again. Uh, as we stated before, um, we will be sending out the PowerPoint a recorded version of this webinar and the CLE forms to all of you probably later today or tomorrow. So please look for that. If by tomorrow afternoon you don't receive anything, uh, you can e email Christina or myself at mlore at azleague.org and we will make sure you uh, receive that information. So with that, we will, uh, oh, we have one, one question that came in. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. So with that, we will end today. Thank you very much. Have thank a great you. rest of your afternoon and uh, goodbye, everybody. Bye, thank you.